Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome students, presenters, faculty, and community members to the 2018 Greater Visions Public Forum. Uh, a few housekeeping details to begin with. Please make sure that you have your cell phones on silent. It would be greatly appreciated. Uh, I understand that President Trump will be putting out a I'll have an alert message at 11.15, so everyone's phones will probably be ringing off the hook at that particular time, so just be aware of that. Uh, please be courteous when uh, you enter and leave the ballroom, so not to uh, interrupt the panel discussion. Uh, restrooms are out the door and to the left, and uh, again, I'd like to welcome you very much to this uh, Greater Visions Public Forum in 2018. We have live streaming at Hartnell, and I do believe we're on the CSUMB uh, YouTube channel, and so I would like to uh, welcome everyone who is at those remote sites, including Cabrillo College, and I greatly appreciate uh, your attendance today. And. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Scott Fosty, and I'm the MC for this event. And I uh, welcome you again to this event. And so to begin, I'd like to uh, give you a little background on Greater Vision. Greater Vision is an annual education uh, event created through collaboration between California State University, Monterey Bay, and the Growers Shippers Association Foundation, which launched in 2006. Greater Vision provides a series of public forums featuring speakers and panel discussions from community members, academic researchers, elected officials, public agencies, and agricultural representatives. The series addresses agricultural issues important to agriculture and the larger community and designed for the general public. Each series addresses various issues that are important to agriculture and the larger community and is designed to inform college students from both CSUMB Hartnell, Cabrillo College, along with the general public. This year's forum is on education, careers, and energy uh, technology, and so, and sustainability. And so we're very excited about this particular event because it is focused on education and our students here at CSUMB and our partner junior colleges. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Sean Cometh, and Dr. Sean Cometh is the founding dean of the College of Business at CSUMB, Monterey Bay, and has held academic and administrative positions at numerous leading universities in the United States, Canada, Asia, and Europe. He is an outstanding scholar with over 80 publications and author of three books and is a member of several nonprofit and for-profit firms. And I, uh, I greatly admire his leadership and, the, uh, and his contributions to the College of Business and to CSUMB uh, in general. Dr. Comet. I have to lower this because of Scott's immense height. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I, as I came in, I felt the rain in my hair the little that's left, and in my face. And that is propitious because we come from the greatest agricultural region in the country, and it's wonderful to have the first rain on the day we are having our summit, or our forum, on the future of farming and changing jobs. So thank you very much for being here. As Scott pointed out, this is the ninth forum uh, that we have partnered with the Growers Shippers Association Foundation and CSUMB. It's been a wonderful partnership and I want to thank particularly the folks from the Growers Shippers F uh, Association Foundation, Dennis Donahue, their uh, chair, uh, Lisa Dobbins, uh, director, and the board of which uh, our Scott is a member and uh, of which Mary Lou Shockley, our chair, was previously the chair of. So, we have a close connection. As Scott described, this is a yearly event uh, that celebrates our achievements, but also updates our students and uh, the public on current agricultural 
and societal issues and trends, especially for this region. Now, as you know, the high-speed mobile internet, artificial intelligence, data analytics, the biological revolution that's taking place, and cloud technology are set up to uh, spearhead uh, change at companies in terms of what they do with new technologies. And there is a big change coming right between now, 2018, and 2022 because of the power of the exponential. So um, many will look uh, towards things like machine learning, virtual uh, reality, augmented reality as creating a lot of these jobs. But also coming are the robots. So the robots are coming, and we expect that stationary robots will be uh, a very major part of our employment uh, picture in 2022, with different industries having different rates of growth. But of course, agribusiness, and particularly agribusiness in this region, has taken the lead with the ag tech revolution, with Salinas becoming the center of the ag tech revolution as a result of the work of Dennis and many others, and Dennis is kind of the fountainhead of this, the start of this revolution. Uh, what it's done is it's transforming the region. Now, if you look at the numbers, they are pretty interesting. The World Economic Forum estimates that by 2022, today's newly er emerging occupations are set to grow from the current 15% to about 30% of all jobs. While job roles currently affected by technological change are going to decrease from 31% to 21% of the workforce. In purely quantitative terms, 75 million jobs are likely to be displaced because of technology during this short period, but will be made up by what the World Economic Forum estimates are 133 million jobs with the new skills that are required to have those jobs. So currently an average of 71% of all jobs are done by humans with 29% being done by machines and uh, or algorithms. By 2022, the average will be 55% by humans and 45% by machines and algorithms. So you can see there is a sea change going on that we should be aware of. All this has profound implications for all of you who are here as students, uh, for our agribusiness and other sector firms, of course for our university because we have to change what we do, and the future work and lifestyle of our community. Uh, Dennis and I um, met, I believe it was in February at Hartnell College, we were at the ABTI meeting when we first had a discussion on this idea of talking about what the future jobs are going to look like. And the result is today's forum, I think, after many enhancements and many improvements on what we had discussed. And I hope you will enjoy the result and learn much from the outstanding speakers, panelists, and experts on the to topic that are gathered here today. I want to thank GSAF uh, for uh, uh, this long partnership and for being the prime mover for this event. I also want to thank uh, Professor Scott Fausty. Uh, in spite of being injured, he has, uh, uh, he has soldiered on to bring this forum to close. Chair Mary Lou Shockley, back there. Uh, IIED Program Manager Mary Jo Zenk, who's been very instrumental, and others at CSUMB for their leadership in making this forum possible. Uh, many thanks to all our speakers experts and sponsors for making the forum pons, uh, possible. I also want to uh, uh, thank all of you, students and public, who are here today and support this forum. I believe there's a group today at uh, Cabrillo College and Hartnell College who are joining us via the live stream of this forum at their campuses. So let me wave to them and say uh, welcome. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our provost and vice president of academic affairs at CSUMB, Dr. Bonnie Irvin. Bonnie has been an outstanding uh, and dynamic leader since she came to CSUMB a little over four years ago. Uh, she um, uh, she has the unusual gift of being an exceptional thought leader and game changer, but also a sterling doer. 
and getting things done. So our campus is fortunate to have her wisdom and energy as we have grown. When I came, there were 5,600 students. Today, we have close to 8,500 students. So that's been uh, Bonnie's, uh, a lot of Bonnie's doing, and Bonnie's leading us through that uh, growth. I'm pleased to ask her to share her perspective with you today, Bonnie Irvin. Shama's is a great press agent, isn't he? I feel really important now here. Um, you know, a year ago when we did this event, we were over in Seaside and the topic was water. And so it seems only appropriate today that we see water. I, I was a little, you know, grumpy when I was coming from my car, but then realized that no matter how far the technological revolution in agriculture goes, we're always gonna need water. And we prefer that it come from the sky and not have to take it from somewhere else. So, all good. So welcome to the Greater Vision event. On behalf of President Ochoa and the CSUMB community, I'd like to welcome you both to this event and to our campus, for those of you who are joining us from the outside. It is indeed a pleasure for me to, to be here, to hear some of the um, speakers today, and to learn more about what's going on in the future of agriculture. Now, CSUMB values collaboration both across units within the university and with our community, industry, education, and civic partners. A key component in preparing our students to thrive as responsible citizens in the future. Student preparation requires many partners, like the ones here today and the ones watching. We have great college partners, like Hartnell, Monterey Peninsula College, Cabrillo, some of whom are joining us here today, and online, and the ag community, and those colleagues in the energy, technology, and public sector who provide internships and really valuable experiences for our students. As the largest industry in Monterey County, agriculture, both the science and the business of it, is more and more important to the success of our students and our university. And events like Greater Vision allow us to talk about how we may better partner with one another for the benefit of our county, our region, and the state of California. Of course, one of the most important ways the university gives back is to produce graduates who are qualified to go work in these industries and make valuable contributions both to community and to work. This particular greater vision, thus, is designed for students to increase their understanding of careers in ag and energy sectors in the future. And it is indeed about the future. How best shall we predict what careers will be available 10 years from now? We're looking into all of our crystal balls, we're running our numbers, we're trying to forecast, and trying to figure out really what that world is, is going to look at. And by assembling a group today of visionaries and leaders in this industry, we will hopefully envision that future together. So thank you to all who are participating today, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Cometh and Provost Irwin. Uh, so let us begin. Uh, first, I would like to thank our sponsors who provided both uh, uh, contributions, both in uh, monetary and in kind. Uh, we have the Grower Shippers Association Foundation, of which I am a uh, member of uh, the foundation board. Uh, California State University, Monterey Bay. Blue Tech Valley, which is a consortium of CSU universities working on entrepreneurial and energy issues. Uh, and uh, of course, the College of Business and uh, Thrive. Thank you very much to our sponsors. We would not have been able to put on this program without you. Thank you. And I would like to introduce um, our first uh, panel, which is really a fireside chat. And uh, so the future of, of the farm and the future and the changing workforce, a keynote conversation. And our panelists will be uh, Dr. or I should say Mr. Dennis Donahue and uh, Ms. Uh, Megan Nunes. And so uh, I do believe that 
uh, Dennis and Ding, what? Come on, All right? There we go. Thank you very much. And I'll provide some information on their background. Thank you. There we go. And uh, Dennis is our keynote moderator. Dennis Donahue leads the Western Grower Center for Innovation and Technology in Salinas. He is also the current, uh, currently the chairman of the Grower Shippers Association Foundation and the former chairman of the Grower Shippers Association of the Central Coast. Previously, previously Dennis served as the mayor of Salinas from 2006 to 2012. Uh, our guest uh, for the keynote is uh, Megan Nunes. Uh, as founder and CEO of Vinesight, Megan News provides a unique outlook spanning several industries over, with over a decade of experience in the aerospace industry. Megan has held various levels of leadership roles such as COO and CEO of small satellite startups. As CEO, she oversaw the creation and move of a new startup and was directly responsible for bringing on new hires. Megan worked at agriculture engineering firm where she was responsible for direct sales, contracts, and ongoing customer meetings. All this allows Megan to lead Vinesight in providing what the agricultural industry really needs while leveraging technology and methods from aerospace and tech as a whole. Let us welcome. Dennis. And Megan. Thank you, Dennis. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm pretty impressed to be sitting on stage with you. So <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks, thanks for joining us, Megan. Let me, uh, let me just add quickly uh, how we ended up on this topic. If you are hanging around boardrooms, companies, ag tech events, uh, educational circles, uh, there, there really is a very serious conversation about tomorrow's workforce. I, I continue to be struck by the uh, con uh, Leon Panetta's last forum when he had uh, this one of the CEOs of one of the Intel divisions, Renee James, who made the comment that the top 10 jobs in the region didn't exist 10 years ago. And, uh, and I, I was telling Megan, uh, my, my wife thinks I'm a good candidate to be on the hoarder show. I, I, I save things. Articles I actually think I will read again. Uh, <laughs> So it, if you're in the produce industry, there's a, periodic, there's a weekly publication called The Packer. And there was a fellow named Ward Fredericks, uh, who was kind of the leading uh, placement guy in the game. And he, he wrote an article at the beginning, of the, uh, the beginning of 1990, so I'm now aging myself. And I, yes, I am old enough to be Megan's father. Uh, and he said, this is what's going to happen over the next decade. And he was right. It's, it's what happened. And we're, we're, we're at a seminal moment uh, of change in agriculture again. And it's an interesting moment, and it's appropriate uh, that ag and education are, are having this conversation. Uh, and you're going to find out one of the things that's special when I uh, was asked to who would you like to have this conversation about tomorrow's workforce? I immediately thought of Megan, and I think you'll see why in a moment. But the, ba but the backdrop of the conversation is um, several months ago, I was talking to uh, Ted Taylor, and I have, permission, I have permission to tell this story. And he said, you know, I, I was chatting with my dad, and I said, and they do a lot of innovation work, and he said, it's almost, and I told him, I said, it's almost like I'm either dealing with someone who's all ag or all tech. It's almost like we need a new kind of worker. And so the question is, over the next 10 years, uh, what's the farm going to look like? All of the things you heard described in terms, robots cannot be stationary, by the way. They need to move. <laughs> uh, but they're going to be on the farm. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. But, you know, we're talking about replicating the human form, you know, who's going to make it, who's going to operate it. So we're going to need a new kind of worker. And how do we get there and what does that farm look like? And uh, so Megan and I had a chance to visit uh, last night a little bit. And I said, well, I, I, you know, in some respects, this is pretty simple. How do we get more use? <laughs> so let, let's, 
so I want, with that, uh, Megan, welcome. And uh, uh, so let, let's start a little bit uh, just talking about your, your background. Yeah. You grew up in Gustine. All of you who have been through Gustine, raise your hand, please. Oh my gosh, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> I, you have to, most audiences I'm in, people don't even know what Gustine is. So my tagline is usually, if you know what it is, you deserve like a prize or something. Because <laughs> nobody knows what Gustine well, is well, or well, where it is. Well, make sure you tell the chamber that. that, yeah, you know, that exactly. That's one of the ways to get more people there. How do you I figure should, out how to, win the, how do you win the prize? Uh, but uh, talk, talk a little bit about uh, your background growing up uh, in Gustine and uh, you know, what did, what did you and your vision your future as you graduated from high yeah. school and started thinking about uh, getting ready to grow up? Yes, it was very different reality than where I'm at now, to be honest. So, um, as first of all, thank you um, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. And um, as Dennis did say, I am originally from Gustine, California, um, which is a very small farming community, as many of you know. Um, I'm from a farming family myself. When I was in high school, I was incredibly involved in the FFA um, organization. And... Um, so much so where I did significant public speaking, I held various leadership roles, I even ran for state office and was slated and got to give a speech at California State FFA convention. Um, I was not elected. And so from there I went on to teach um, basically high school students. I took my first quarter of college from Cal Poly to teach high school students about leadership and agriculture um, throughout the state and in some parts of Arizona and Nevada. And um, after that period, I was dead set on becoming a agricultural lawyer, um, primarily focusing on the dairy industry, because Gustine is a very heavy dairy business and area, um, to support air and water quality issues, which was something I studied quite a bit of. Uh, while I was in college, I found myself, um, around my sophomore year, bored um, about the people that I was kind of surrounded with. Everybody had the exact same backstory as me. We were all the same types of people. We came from the same types of family. Um, we all knew the same types of things, and I started to feel kind of unchallenged in my overall personal development. Um, around that same period, my parents were like, hey, uh, it's time for you to go get a job. Like, you had scholarships, you did well. <laughs> it's time for you to contribute. And um, I got a part-time job at this aerospace company that was building small satellites um, for NASA, JPL, um, and what's called the CubeSat standard, which is basically satellites in the shape of a bread box. And um, while I was at that company, the CEO, um, who was a brilliant man, gave me incredible opportunity to sit at the table with engineers and to get the opportunity to write contracts. And eventually that job ended up turning into a career. And I spent about eight plus years working in aerospace and remote sensing. And um, that has sort of kind of, I think, built the foundation to now lead me into an entrepreneurial path, much like my parents. Um, to start my own company, Vinsight, which I did a few years ago. So you, you went on to Cal Poly. Yes. And uh, as we were chatting last night, and that you've elaborated on it nicely, yeah. so you're, you're out of the satellite industry. Yes. But you're not an engineer. No, 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 no. And I'm still not an engineer. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm intrigued by, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the kind of the questions I was going to ask you towards the end, because I keyed in on looking at your, your background, your your speaking skills and your having been involved in presentation skills and how do you, how do you, how do you use that? Uh, and, and it sounds like that served you well pretty, pretty quickly and that's how you got a lot of responsibility at an, er, at an early age. Yeah, and I think being the oldest of four girls helps at some level. I'm, I'm a classic oldest child um, in a lot of ways. I'm a first generation college student as well and so there were a lot of things that I as a young person had to identify and figure out on my own just because simply my parents were unsure. Um, and that is kind of a trait that has been part of who I am as a person since I was very small. Um, and it's even kind of when I got into the position at the previous aerospace company that I worked at, um, I just, it was like a whole new world that had opened up for me of possibilities and opportunities and things I knew absolutely nothing about. I'm a very curious person and so naturally I became kind of like a, I had, I was getting like two educations, one in dairy science and another one at, at this aerospace startup that was building small satellites and I, where I really thrived honestly was in that area and I kind of drifted away from the world of uh, ag right, and right. where I was actually studying academically but, in a but, lot of ways. You know, I, no I noticed you said you, you kind of got a little, a little bored, didn't feel as challenged yes. in, in college, and it sounded like you hadn't even gotten to your junior year in that, that. and yeah. so you're in your 20s, mm -hmm. already getting a lot of significant 
responsibility. Yes. And in fact, uh, you, you ran a company. Yeah. Uh, but s s somehow, uh, at, at some point, uh, the entrepreneurial urge struck. Yes. Uh, how, talk, talk about it. I mean, was that just listening to you talk? It may have been in your DNA all along, it's but so what, what caused that? At some level, I, I've, I've um, I always knew I wanted to do something on my own, like f physically feeling the, um, the idea of building something out of nothing. Like I, I wanted that, that tangibility. And um, seeing my parents do that firsthand, and also I was born into parents starting a business at a time where their company was one year old and I was brand new to their life and they needed to figure things out. And um, it really wasn't until about towards the end of my career in aerospace that um, I looked around and I thought, you know what, I've always wanted to do something on my own. I've been helping other people build and establish their businesses. And um, the company I was at was, we had just launched two satellites in over six months, which had been unheard of. And we were, it was also kind of at the right time of ag tech forming um, kind of a, a buzzword, if you will. And I decided, okay, you know what, like I've always wanted to do something. As I looked around at the different players within the ag tech space, I had noticed something that um, you kind of touched on earlier, uh, two polarizing ideas. It was mostly at, the, at that time, tech people solving problems for ag. And many of the solutions that they were going after were sort of like moonshots. They were really far removed to some of the very simple low-hanging fruit areas that would be simple problem-solving skills that tech is really good at doing. But for some reason, they kind of tried to skip too many levels of um, problem-solving, if you will. And I kind of decided that it was time for me to leave the nest and um, at some level follow in my parents' footsteps. Um, and tap onto something that I had always been kind of interested in doing myself. So, so talk, talk a little bit about that. Talk, t for instance, talk, talk uh, how old Vinsight is, uh, how many employees you have. I, I, was, re I was really in, intrigued, uh, uh, you, you know, in terms of how you have to get something started, look like it's actually starting, yeah. but behind the line you're <laughs> paddling like heck yeah. to, to make, make it all happen, and then at some point you get traction. Talk, talk about yeah. that whole process. So um, where Vinsight is at now is very different than in the beginning. And in the beginning, I would say it was like a sheer passion for this notion of utilize my original hypothesis of utilizing satellite imagery in a more meaningful way to benefit agriculture. And since then, that has totally changed. But in the very beginning, it was a lot of like putting together information and trying to form a conversation around, okay, who could I get to talk to me? And so I spent a lot of time my first phase was research, um, trying to identify who are the key leaders and organizations that are even thinking about utilizing remote sensing data and satellite imagery. Um, starting to cold email those people and cold call them in any possible way to be like, hey, look at me, listen to me. I also leveraged my network and um, I've gone to college with a bunch of great people that ended up going on to be leaders in some of these organizations and I shoulder tapped them and asked for help. Um, would you get me a meeting with so-and-so because I've heard X, Y, and Z about them and I think they would be beneficial in all of these reasons, sort of building my case. And really at the time, it was based, like just me and um, the, per the person who actually gave me my first job, um, whose name is Tomas Vitek, um, and he gave me the technical credibility because he has a PhD from Caltech in planetary physics. That'll do it. Yes, yeah, that yeah. helps a yeah, lot, right? Know, and yeah. then um, I myself, some no-name like person who was just trying to problem solve for an industry that I wanted desperately to be back a part of. And um, in the beginning, people basically, I got a lot of doors slammed. Most people were like, yeah, this sounds interesting, um, but I'm not totally sold. Uh, the first moment I'll ever forget, it was a meeting that I had at a large winery in Modesto, California. And they said, you know what? What you're talking about, it sounds really interesting. We're not totally sure that what you're saying is possible, but we're willing to listen. And that's all I needed, like, listen, great. So from there, we figured out every possible way to engage them. Um, and mostly it starts with all businesses have problems that they need solved. And oftentimes, the reasons businesses aren't solving those problems themselves is because they're busy doing everything else they need to do to keep themselves afloat and being able to move from today to tomorrow. And so if you start thinking about problem solving for ag and ag tech in that way, it really changes the mindset around not every farmer needs a drone, to be honest with you. Like that is not a reality that we will, I think, 
live in, especially in the short term. And we're starting to see some of that fallout with drone companies not having some of the success that they promised investors. And um, starting with kind of like, the customer will tell you what their problem is if you just listen. And I think it helps having kind of this split um, internal personality between ag and technology within myself is, that is helps. Is it difficult? You know, I remember hosting a deal for the Silicon Valley Business Journal, and mm -hmm. I thought I was very cute when I looked at the tech audience, and I said, you know, I'm from Salinas, and, you know, we have coffee shops in Salinas, and we talk about all of you, and we and we keep wondering why you are solving solving problems we didn't know we had. Right. And, you know, and I, I, I thought that was cute. It, yes. uh, and, and, it turns out that's not unique to ag. Right. Uh, and in many respects, I learned over time, I, I need to be more respectful of that creative process that right. they're, you know, they're going to create technology in the lab, and then, of course, you're going to go see, can you make it work? But, so, but c coming out, do you, does tech find it, uh, you talk about just listening. To, that, that seems like such common sense, but is, is that difficult? Um, yes and no. I mean, it, at the foundation of when Vensite started, our hypothesis was so large and kind of widespread with the notion of like, I'm not really sure what it is that we're going to build, but I know we're going to build something useful. And at the primary data source of that being useful, I wanted remote sensing to be part of that. Talk about remote, explain what, explain what that is. Yeah. We hear a lot about drones and, you know, what, what, are the, what are the various options to gather information and what to do with it and wh why you're such a fan of remote sensing. Yeah, so um, remote sensing is for purposes of kind of what I'm talking about is multi-spectral imagery, um, which one of the primary data sources that we use comes all from satellites. And um, what basically multi-spectral imagery is, is ba like a, think of a filter on a lens that allows um, you to certain add up and subtract certain bands in order for you to identify certain indices. So many of you have probably heard of something called NDVI, which basically allows you to look at crop health um, on a color scale of red meaning something's bad, green meaning everything's okay, yellow means there's something wrong, we're not sure, but there's something there. Um, so those indices can all be added up and subtract to come up with several other different types of um, indices that are not just NDVI. And Canopy Health can tell you a lot about kind of the stage of crop and where you're at in that process, but it doesn't necessarily give you an answer as to ultimately what am I going to produce at the end of the year, which means how much money am I going to make, so that way I can figure out the best way to utilize my returns in the way that I manage my portfolio of crops, whether that be through how I'm paying for water and how much water I'm going to think about using, and then how much am I paying for fertility and so on and so forth. Um, and so reasons why I am a fan of remote sensing um, data, and that comes to you in a variety of different areas. Some of it is through drone, plane, and then satellite imagery. Um, why we like satellite imagery so much is because it is stable in terms of um, the quality of image that you get every time you fly over a specific region. You're going to get the exact same picture in the exact same period of time of day, which matters when you're thinking about taking that data and doing something with it because it allows you to actually crunch through and make the information clean, if you will, is the term we use in the data world. Um, and remote satellite imagery allows for a scalability that allows you to think globally around solving certain problems as opposed to it being on a field-by-field -field basis. Um, but at the same time, it also allows you to zoom in and get the field-specific information that you're needing So rem well. remote sensing is how you do business, but it's not necessarily the product. No, it is the, not our product What at is all. the product? So, um, Vinsight is a crop forecasting company, and we forecast high value and specialty crops, primarily grapes and almonds in the state of California, as well as Australia. Um, and we look at data sets from four primary categories, which include satellite imagery, climate and weather information, geographical information around slope, soil type, and then physical location of where these crops are located, and then finally historical yield, which is what allows us to calibrate our model performance to identify um, how accurate are we when we say that almond production is going to be 2.3 billion pounds in the month of April, for example. We'll talk a little bit, so for instance, the, the first winery that you talked to, we're not sure. Yeah. Um, Everyone has an interest in information. Right. So, you know, I, I, I know some of our friends who will be on the, the next panel will, you know, beg and plea, can somebody please get me out of Excel hell with right. all the information ag is responsible for. So what, what was proof of concept for the 
the first group, how did you, how did you get your first customer? And uh, yeah, so um, we got our first customer for by getting them to listen, and then from there it, it was a slow process. We spent, I would say, about two years really building and refining models that worked, um, because when you sell into the agriculture industry, you only get one basically time to sell because the season is annual, and if you don't approach them at a specific time in the season, you basically have lost your shot until next year. Furthermore, what you're selling them needs to be accurate because if you're not accurate, then you're also going to lose that customer's ear and they're going to say, okay, we tried this, we're moving on. You didn't give me the results that I wanted. And so for us, our first customers, it was important for them to be people that were willing to take risk. Um, they needed to be first mover um, kind of adopters within the industry. And they also needed to understand that this is like a project that we are trying things on and we're trying to figure right, out if right. this is possible. And once we got to a place where we were able to generate meaningful results, it was kind of like things changed overnight. So, you know, some, sometimes the enemy of the good is good enough to, you right. know, the farming community in particular tends to think we know our crop, we know our weather, we, you know. So what are you, what are you competing against coupled with, you know, how do, how, how do you make the case that this really is better and it, 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 this, is gonna, this is gonna help your bottom line? Right. So. Um, in terms of status quo, which I would argue in a lot of ways it's kind of our biggest competitor, um, most of the time you get people that, there are people that I've had meetings with that have said, I know my forecast better than anybody else, we're accurate year over year, and there's no way that like there's anything more that you could tell me about my crop. I will take frost as an example for this year's California almond production. Right. Um, there probably isn't a single person in this room who did not see a headline of California almonds basically are going in reverse in production this year because of frost, and we have no idea what's gonna happen. Um, the markets for the 2017 crop saw a spike in like $1 plus in pricing, and then you also had um, people that were panicking about what do we even do with the 2018 crop? Do we, do we feed it? Do we let it go? I remember having conversations with some really large processors that were like, this year's shot, you don't understand, it's so bad, all these other things. So being that Vinsight is a data company and we are information first without bias, we decided, okay, let's study and look at all of the years because we have a 20 year database of information, all the years historically where frost actually happened within the bloom period of California almond production. And there were a couple interesting things that we identified. Um, the first being that more often than not in years of frost, we also had some of the highest production on a per acre basis for California almond production. We also identified that um, frost didn't necessarily have a correlation with poor crop outcome and output. And so we published that information everywhere. Um, we also used it within our marketing materials in particular for 2018 to get some customers that were still interested but weren't totally ready to convert um, as an explanation of that. And then we put out for the first time ever a forecast much earlier than we normally do and then we also included a poll associated with our forecast in order to get kind of measure sentiment within the market to identify where is the pack thinking. Are most of them thinking that it's way off or it's not at all? And um, general sentiment proved that frost means bad crop in terms of how people feel and think. Um, but in reality, information and data show that that correlation does not exist um, due to mitigation techniques and a whole bunch of other reasons. Right. Um, and as we're starting to see as the crop is coming here, it's looking like we're going to be not in the reverse from 2017 and that our production is going to increase. Um, and we'll see what the final numbers are, but I am very confident for this year that we are like dead on, which is awesome. Terrific, a bumper so, crop and tariffs, yeah. perfect. There we, the I know, the right. that part I can't help, growers. unfortunately. Yeah. No, no, that, one, that, one's beyond their, that one's beyond their control. By, by, by the way, just the, the white cards uh, that are on people's uh, chairs do not mean those seats are reserved. If, if anyone has questions, make sure uh, uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna save time so if you, if you do have any questions, write them down and I know they'll be collected. So I wanted to make sure uh, we talked about that. Talk, um, talk a little bit about, so you're succeeding, you're making progress. Yes, uh, we're making progress. We'll making, see if we are successful. Well, and you, you know, and this is, and, and, let, and let's take a moment because I think this is an interesting conversation. We, you know, in this whole ag tech world, which is really pretty, pretty generic, I mean, if you, right. if you can, if you can tell me exactly what ag, you know, it's, it's really kind of a catch-all in, right. in a phrase, but we, we were chatting a little bit last night about 
uh, who has succeeded in, in ag tech? So as you look at the category, because you know, you're, besides building your own company, you're, you're on the circuit and you, right. see, you see everything and every, everyone. Who, who's, who has succeeded or who is succeeding? Or how do you define success in, in this sector? So uh, for purposes of, like from an investor standpoint, success is measured by acquisitions or companies that go public. And so it's hard to not recognize that we have had some decent exits within the ag tech space. Most notably would be Climate Corporation, who was sold to Monsanto for like almost a billion dollars, which was insane. And that was really early in, the, in this process. Um, and then as of more recently, you've seen some um, additional companies like Granular who got acquired. Right. Um, and then more recently, Blue River Technologies right. as well and their acquisition that happened there. So in terms of, from an acquisition standpoint, I do think that from an acquisition and investor standpoint, we are starting to see some proof of concept that some of the technologies that are being developed out of ag tech companies um, will show promising returns but it's for really investors. But proof, it's really proof of concept. It, it, right. it, it isn't wholesale penetration and adoption of right. the, by and, the industry. And to be honest, I think that there's still the ag tech space needs market consolidation. Like if you start to look at, we'll take the sensor category for example, um, just because it's one that reminds me of where drones were when I first started Vinsight. There are lots of different sensor companies and all these sensor companies promise to do different things, but yet they all kind of still do the same thing. Um, but yet we st like there's tens of twenties of them and I feel like new ones popping up every day. Um, and so in terms of figuring out market share and what percentage of acreage do you have within a specific crop type that you cover, or if you want to just lump all agricultural land together, we're still in the very early days for seeing a company that has the potential to go, like let's say to IPO, or um, becoming a major challenger to some of your big guys out there, like your Syngentas of the world right, and right. Bayer and so on, right? right? Um, and so from that standpoint, it's still very, very early. Um, and I would argue that most of us are in like somewhere between the infant stage, correction, it's like we're somewhere between embryo and like late stage infant um, in terms well, that, of much. That, that, that's relatively early. It is, we are, I, but it's, it's true because in terms of actual widespread use of technology, right, right. we it's not necessarily there. Um, if you think about, especially if you think about agriculture as a whole from the standpoint of a global market and players that operate in California don't just play here. They also are growing in Mexico or Chile or Australia, some parts of Europe and so on. And so if you think about it from that standpoint, we're still, we're still pretty early. So there's plenty of money. Yes. There's plenty of technology. Yes. So is one of the issues human capital and how we get more use? For instance, if you had to double the size of your company tomorrow, would, would you have a problem finding people? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, on the tech side, no. Um, on the ag with the tech like kind of twist, um, I would also say that would be a little bit more difficult because there's not a lot of people who do have a similar background as I do where I have kind of sat in both worlds. And in all honesty, I do think there's a major opportunity for people that came from agriculture to educate themselves within the tech world to kind of create this new hybrid. And I think that there's tons of opportunity for both high school students and young college students today to start thinking about what does it mean to have a job in ag? And it doesn't mean the same thing of what, how my parents started their business and what they look like. There are opportunities for um, major data players, if you will, um, and for computer scientists to be able to have jobs within the agricultural sector. So what sort of coursework are you looking at or skill sets? And, and then along with that, do you think there, you know, go back to what we said in the beginning, you know, the, the tech world, the 10 top jobs didn't even exist 10 years ago. Right. And, you know, with, with your farming and tech background, is that, you know, I, I would assume there's going to be some similarities. In yeah. So in terms of one of our main core focuses at Vinsight, even if we hire somebody who is like from San Francisco and has a total tech background, um, is the requirement that you have some kind of interest in agriculture. You don't have to come from an agriculture family, but you have to care enough about it to want to know more and to be curious about how to solve for it and to be curious to understand your customer and the way that they think. Um, and so if you meet that criteria and you're also a data scientist, which happens to be one of the most difficult jobs to hire for right now in Silicon Valley, um, 
we primarily try to look for universities. We've tied ourselves closely to some of the major um, universities in the Bay Area, as well as my Cal Poly, one of my favorite schools of choice, personally. Um, and now that I know about CSU Monterey Bay's um, program, I would be happy to kind of learn and put our feelers out into this world. You, you understand there's three of them sitting yes, right there I before do. you even get to the I door. Do. Be, I do. Be, you're going to learn more about being an otter than you ever, <laughs> ever thought possible. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so for us, that's kind of one of the initial areas that we look at because there's a, there's a lot that can be taught on the job and I learned that firsthand. And so if, just because you don't necessarily have the skill set, the willingness to do and the willingness to learn is by far, in my opinion, um, kind of a, a core principle that we look for in people. So maybe you're an early stage data scientist, but like you don't really know much about some of the modeling techniques that we use, no problem. We have the resources to teach you that right, because right. we have been developing that and working on it ourselves. But if you, again, it comes down to the willingness and the drive to learn and to do. And if you have those two fundamental foundations, I mean, the world is your oyster. You can do anything. So talk a little bit, you know, one of my favorite sayings, I always like the saying of George Washington Carver, you know, who, you know, who uh, uh, put peanuts on the map, but he mm -hmm. talked about farming is, and the challenge, and he had a comment that I really like, the challenge is to do the common thing uncommonly well. Right. And you know, you coming from an ag, ag background, you know, I'm always fascinated, you know, some of, the, some of the great growers who are terrific business people, they still get out and they pat the plants. Yeah. So the more, more technology, uh, take, takes root in, in farming. Uh, is, is good farming, that art and science, still going to be important right. or... The romanticized uh, vision of agriculture. Well, well, we, we, we like to think the necessary vision it, of it, agriculture. No, and it good, is, good, but good, it, it's good, very... Good, good farming, Matt, <laughs> is good farming going to matter as much in, in, in the future? Uh, or is technology going to... Uh, uh, Maybe, maybe uh, you know, is it going to be more of an analytic game, or do you do you still have to have kind of that intuitive feel that, you know, my knee's acting up and the weather says this? And, right. Uh, so in terms of good farm, good there's good farming, and then there's being a good farmer that utilizes tools to make yourself more advantageous than your competitors. Right. And analytics and data tools are the tools within your tool chest in order to make you an even better great farmer. There are certain skill sets that I see today with like, and I'll take again the almond industry as a whole, which I understand is very different than Salinas Valley. Um, as an example, that, that industry has grown so quickly that many of the people that have been thrown into positions that are in branch management type positions do not have that same um, background and culture of like, I felt the plant, I touched the soil, and therefore I know X, Y, and Z automatically. Because mm -hmm. that training and that skill set requires serious years of honing um, and training your gut, if you will. And if we operate on a standpoint where we have a large growing crop type and we're not giving these people the effective tools, we will take the, the um, idea of utilizing both an art and a science kind of um, away in some levels. And so those types of people do need better tools in order to understand what is happening and how can I basically yield certain results that ultimately matter to the company's bottom line. And so um, I don't think one would be replaced without the other. Um, there is a reason that agriculture has been um, such a thriving and sustaining kind of business that has outlasted generations of families year over year because of that passion of um, a connection to the dirt and to whatever it is the crop that you're growing and that's the kind of passion that gets a grower to wake up every morning and have the t I, I use the the example oftentimes of the roofie effect at the end of the season to forget about the past and be excited about what's happening right, in the future right. and you can't you can't get away from that because that is a reality that will exist within the agriculture industry however I do think that great farmers can be made even better by benefiting from utilizing data and information tools to further drive and guarantee the decisions that they're making and serve as a double check on their gut. Talk, talk a little bit, we were, we were chatting a little bit last night and you know, I want to take advantage of your background and your, your expertise. You know, one of the challenges, uh, and I find it interesting that we're at this very embryonic phase, mm -hmm. yet indus industry consolidation is already en route for some of, you know, air, you know drones, sensors next to come and so right. so and and you know and i suppose that's kind of the the way of the world and you know there there's a lot of emphasis around here and and indeed throughout the state whether it's the central valley or 
or central, central Coast, this, this automation issue. And so, for instance, you're, you're dealing with adoption and how, how fast, so how, how fast can that realist, realistically go? It sounds like it's more of a attitudinal shift once you've made your case. Right. And then in, in our cases, we're looking at uh, automation um, and, you know, it's kind of a race against time, diminishing uh, an aging workforce and uh, uh, ri rising cost and, you know, how, how, do we get, how do we get more players on the field, so, so to speak? Right. How, do, how does technology go faster? I mean, what, what's involved in that? Is it, is it, tech, is it skills, time, money, co-creation, co working more closely with the, the technology developers? What, what accelerates technology when you need to move quicker? Yeah, so um, fundamentally it starts with who your customer is and what are their problems. And if you're not immediately, if, you're have, if you have a startup in ag tech right now and it's because you thought it was a good idea and you didn't vet that with as many growers as would listen to you as possible, I can tell you right now you're in serious trouble. Um, the fundamentals of any moving quickly in kind of this type of space is you need to start with what are the customer's problems. Let them tell you what their issues are. And then from there, it is your job to go and solve and build a quick prototype, respond, get feedback, and then take that feedback, and then it's an iterative process. And so it's keeping your customer in the loop. My company had the opportunity to go through um, an incubator in Silicon Valley called YC, or Y Combinator, um, which some of you might be familiar with. And when we were going through YC, one of the things that they teach you is the importance of keeping your customer in the loop. You cannot talk to your customer enough or your potential customer. There is, in, there is a no universe that can exist to where you cannot have enough face time with them in terms of, especially when you're iterative and you're building something, um, of getting that testing and that proof of concept through. And so from a fundamental standpoint, I do think that as much as the market does need some consolidation because it needs focus, um, I do think that the companies that are coming to the stage, whether they're new or existing, we need to be talking more. Um, with people that are actually at the helm of these organizations and operating and running them to make sure that we're still on track to what it is that you need to solve. Because people's solutions change and there's such things as pivots and kind of turning and rotating in certain ways in order to make sure um, that you're actually building something that's both meaningful um, and at the same time going to allow for that sort of scalability that's needed to be venture relevant. You know, it's, it, it, it's interesting. We we talk about being in the early infancy, but you know, the whole ag tech discussion has been going on in some fashion or another for right. for nearly a decade now. Uh, so, when you knock on doors, are you uh, sensing a certain amount of fatigue with 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 all with the the category in general? And does that make your job harder to say, yeah, but this this is distinct. This will matter data is going to be with you. In uh, some ways, yes. Okay. Um, and I will say, and when I say, in, I mean from an infant stage, I mean in terms of adoption and market share. I don't think any company has really proved that out. In terms of technologies that are out there, I mean, they're, they're vast and some people are further along than others. Um, in terms of from the customer standpoint, I would say there is a little bit of fatigue or a little bit of wait a second, everybody seems like they're saying the same thing. Because if you look at certain marketing materials that some companies have nowadays, like you could line up 10 companies and like black out who the company name is and they would all like look like the same entity. Um, and within that type of language, it does make it difficult to sell into the customer because there is some of that fatigue that is there or a misunderstanding around well, why is your product different than this one? And then furthermore, how many more widgets and dashboards do I need to be looking at when my workflow is already consistent of like 10 different dashboards that tell me different things? Um, and so I, I do think we're starting to see a little bit of that. But at the end of the day, if you're building a great product, if you're getting your customers to love you, you will be able to sustain the fatigue and you will be able to still um, engage within customer adoption. T talk about how you spend your day. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're a CEO. <laughs> this, is the, this is the first time it's your company rather than... Right. Some, what, what do you do? What, do you, what are you thinking about yeah. day to day, week to week, month to month? It depends, like every day is so different. Um, and right now we are in the fundraising period and so typically most of my job is actually right now dealing with investors, but which is kind of unusual for um, my day to day life. Typically, um, my day to day life involves a, a myriad of things. So I am our current salesperson, our entire staff and team is um, technical, whether they are a data scientist or a data pipeline engineer or 
a computer software developer for product standpoint, because that's where our primary focus has been. And on the sales side, I have been handling all of that myself. And so um, it depends on if I have my sales hat on and I'm driving up and down the Central Valley um, or parts of Napa Valley, parts of the Central Coast as well, um, in order to meet with customers and in order to engage with new potential customers. Um, I'm also then thinking a lot about where is Vinsight now and how can we take our technology and apply it to the varying um, areas of the supply chain that forecasting matters to, because we're not just um, a company that benefits the grower and field. Forecasting is very beneficial to people all along the value chain within ag, whether you be a buyer um, from a major grocer or um, you be somebody who is a middleman from a processor standpoint that's responsible for trading that product um, through export and so on. And so, um, and then I have all kinds of other operational things like making sure payroll gets done yeah. <laughs> and um, sure that's important. making sure that we have somebody who cleans the office and all kinds of other things. So my, my job really, it varies on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what's the product? Yeah. So let's say, because you have customers, yeah. you, you have revenue, yeah. and so and you're, you're selling, you're building the business. So if, if I'm on board, how, how often am I, am I getting a report? Yeah. Uh, what, what's, what's the product? How, when, yeah, and where do I get so, it? Do I get um, that from you or is it customer service? Um, Vin, no, you typically at the moment you deal with me and you deal with our head of product. Um, if you have questions or issues, you call my cell phone or you um, email me directly um, or you email our head of product directly as well. And so in terms of kind of our product is a web application um, that you go to and basically when you log in, um, you're immediately taken to your forecasts and we give you what the forecasts are for either your field or a specific region and then we give you the top drivers that are affecting that forecast and so um, this was something that we learned from a trust standpoint that was very important early on when you sell something predictive the humans natural instinct is to think that I don't I already know everything so I, how am I supposed to believe and trust your number even though you've showed me that through 20 years historical that you're 95% accurate so we show you the top three things that are ultimately weighing on why that number is what it is. Because oftentimes the number that we put out is different than what somebody is expecting. I would say like 60% of the time that is true. Um, and then we also have a weather portion of our product as well that updates on an hourly basis and shows you a trend line in terms of where you're at today in relation to this same point in time last year, whether you're above or below from a growing degree day standpoint, or if it's in the winter time, chill units or chill portions. Um, and then min and max temperature precipitation. We have an ET calculation as well. Um, and we also allow for like some back data trending so you can kind of see how you compare historically and what your overall averages are. Um, and that varies by looking at an average the entire state and then for each county or your specific location and area of interest. So, and, and the nut business is particularly global. Yes, it is. Uh, so, if, so if I'm in that business in the Central Valley and you mentioned you have a weather product, can I can I get a handle on what's going on in other parts of the world? You can get a handle on what's going on in Australia at the moment, okay. because that's the other part of the world that we are in okay. right now. Um, and for us, that just had a lot to do with some customers that we have in California that grow there, and it made sense for us to get two growing seasons in one year, so here we are. But eventually, yes, you could. All right, well, it looks like, I, I, I know we've been, we've been run, we've been, uh, Run, running early, so we're, let's uh, finish up with a few comments, and uh, some folks have taken us up on their offer to uh, write, uh, ask, ask a, a few questions. Uh, so talk, talk a little bit about, in, in your mind as you look at all this, and so being part of the ag tech sector, is, is what does the farm look like 10, 10, 10 years from, I mean, what technologies is, if there's going to be, do drones go away? Uh, a lot of people talk about the, the necessity of broadband, but do satellites win and connect, you know, and connectivity, connectivity yeah. is not necessarily what we think it is. What, what's, what's going to go on, on, you know, in very broad, broad strokes? Where, yeah. where, where's all this heading? I do think connectivity is something that's terribly misunderstood by Silicon Valley, and it, in particular when they bring certain products to market and the assumptions that are made around connectivity. Um, for example, I still have a house in Gustine and my internet that is there, I'm paying for the fastest internet I can possibly get from AT&T and it goes down like literally every other hour. I'm like, how does it, like it should just work, <laughs> I don't understand. Um, and so if you, 
If you think about connectivity, I do think that that's one area that majorly needs to be solved, whether that is through satellite broadband, because there is that kind of capability and technology. Um, the question becomes is can that be cheap enough for people in order to utilize it and acquire it? Um, or number two, we do need to figure out ways to be able to bring on what good is a sensor in the field if you cannot access that information immediately. Um, and the same thing with even localized weather station data. We have customers that still send us their weather station data downloaded through a thumb drive, which then gets sent to us. Um, so I would say that that's kind of one major area of interest. And then I have a lot of kind of, um, I would almost argue fantasies or dreams around um, how the um, future of what the farm will look like and the way that digital will kind of play um, a major role in streamlining um, much of our input needs and much of our water needs um, through access of data and information and utilizing that as the core source um, to serve kind of the art side of it as well. Well, that, that almost seems to be a segue for one of, one, of these, one of these questions. So having said what you just said, yeah. is, there, is there a killer app out there oh, that's uh, this is in, said, I, in, in general and, and around your business forecasting? Right, I've gotten this question a lot. Um, and in terms of is there a killer app, like there are so many pillars of information that is needed for a company like Vinsight to be successful. And so um, in terms of a killer app would be one kind of company that could integrate everything that's happening on farm and then make high quality recommendations around NPNK and around what your water specific needs are and kind of the notion of how do you close the loop in farming to identify what is really increasing yields or is it impossible to increase yields because there's a limitation on what the weather is allowing us to produce this year, for example. Um, that, in my opinion, would be an incredible app because then you could also increase you could introduce sustainability within that and kind of give people a sustainability grade from an A to C scale um, and service that traceability through to the consumer in order to allow them to identify, I'm willing to pay 25 cents more because X farmer has an A across sustainability in all of these regions and showing that my consumer dollars will vote to be willing to pay for that, for example. Question, As you, so with a lot of imagery and gathering information, yeah. and you've, you've been focused a lot on, uh, or there's a lot of discussion about forecasting, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about we have to do more with less and, you know, you've had an interest right. in, in, in water and, you know, technology doesn't create, create more water, infrastructure and policy. Right, so, exactly. And even if, you know, you could uh, flip a switch and say, golly gee whiz, we're going to have 10 new dams, but right. uh, that's not going to happen for 20 years. So, th so this issue of uh, information uh, as, it, it, as it affects the opportunity to control timing and use the tools at um, Precision Ag. Um, the input discussion is, is also a, a, a big part of the ag discussion, you right. know, that we're going to have to do more than le with less because uh, of costs. So are you getting asked um, to help with other, other parts of farming? For instance, if you have more information, are you able to take a look at uh, your pesticides and your fertilizers and your other inputs because logically if you're min cutting back a little bit on water you don't necessarily want your inputs out, out of balance so are, so are growers asking for that type of information? Right, so uh, in some ways there's a, there's a forcing function through sigma um, around like some of the issues around nitrogen leaching for example and nitrogen happens to be tied very closely to what's my yield going to be and so if you can perfectly match your potential yield with a high degree of accuracy and your nitrogen, you're basically going to eliminate waste and therefore expense or cost. Um, and so initially in the start, that is primarily kind of at the, I would say, at the forefront of most of the conversations in terms of how we think about um, the notion of closing the loop and taking in data and information, we do think that there are ways that you could potentially use that data to kind of pattern recognize when certain pests would be detected because a right. lot of that is tied to, again, the weather. Um, and I, there's a lot I could say on that, but I also saw the sign that I want to be uh, cognizant of how much time Yeah, well, that's five minutes for you and me. Now we've got a few minutes to uh, take ah, okay, questions cool. for the audience. Awesome. So put your, put your sales hat back on. Yeah. And uh, you're dealing with a lot of different people and... Uh, you're, you're trying to uh, cl close a customer or get, get something moving. Uh, ha your services, how do you charge for them? And do you occasionally kind of roll up your sleeves and go, you know what, 
I'll prove it to you. I'm I'm gonna get you know I'm gonna give you the first month free or right. do, you, do you ever have to yeah. you know say look I'm I'm gonna give you this on and I'm, but I'm gonna bet on the other end uh, yeah. you're gonna be my best um, customer. How, so do, how do you do that? The word the word free is an interesting one because sometimes when you give people something away for free, the notion that there that information is important or the idea to want to use it. Um, becomes lesser psychologically for some reason. I'm not sure why, but that is in fact the case of what, what I have seen. Um, in terms of kind of the way that we are, what our sales cycle looks like, if you will, um, we typically, if you're a new customer who either, typically people have come to us as of recently, it's very rare now that we're actually cold calling people um, just because we're, our sales team is all of one. Um, and so what, we'll, what we will do is we'll say like, okay, listen, here's, Talk to us, why does forecasting matter to you? Fundamentally, if forecasting doesn't matter to you, I'm not going to try to sell you. Um, I will just kind of listen to your problems, keep that in the back of my head, and then we'll move on and go from there. Um, in terms of if forecasting does matter to you, we start to kind of walk through how you're doing it today, what are your accuracies, um, how Bensite can be beneficial. In general, our cost point is about 50% 50, 50 cheaper excuse me, than what it costs a grower to run their own forecast themselves. Um, and the way that our pricing um, exists is scalable on a per acre basis in relation to the value of crops. So our range is anywhere from $5 to $50 per acre. The reason being is wine grapes have a very wide um, value um, depending on where they're grown throughout the state, where the average cost is around $25 per acre. And then we also offer a data license that lets you look kind of at scale in the entire state of California in order to benchmark yourself against let's say my fellow growers around Kern County or around Stanislaus County to identify where am I at, am I above or below average um, in relation to kind of where they sit. And then um, the weather application is something that um, is also paid for because of the type of data that we right. give and right. what that looks like um, there. And that runs on a monthly subscription of like 25 99 right. a month. It's pretty it, inexpensive. It, it's a different type of product. Free, free's, free doesn't work necessarily and buy, and buy one, get, get one free right. doesn't necessarily right. work. Right, exactly. Either, so. And I mean, then there's volume discounting sure. and okay. so on right. because we are encouraged to have a larger amount of acreage right. um, that is to be made available okay. as well. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned you're on the prowl for a little dough these days. Yeah. And, uh, and you've been at this for about uh, three years. Two, two questions. So how, how did you get, get started, you know, kind of break into the piggy bank and pass the hat? Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and then how, how common, you know, what do you kind of view the cycle as you, you know, in terms of what you're doing and, and traditional startups between getting started and they're kind of their first, you know, and you get to angels, there's a progression. Yeah. yeah. So talk a, talk a little bit about how you got started and then you know, kind of your observations about just kind of the general financial progression. Yeah, so Vinsight's first early days was started with like a mixture of savings account um, and me basically living off of that while my husband also still worked. Um, so that way we would kind of offset our costs. Um, and then eventually uh, my board member from the previous company that I worked for said, Megan, I believe in what it is that you're doing and I'd be interested in funding you. And so I was very blessed to kind of get an angel from somebody who knew me very well personally um, and had worked on a similar project when he was doing his undergrad at UC Berkeley with remote sensing data. Um, and then from there, um, we, we raised a little bit of outside additional kind of angel capital and kind of really small micro VC money. Um, and then after YC, we raised another later stage round um, after Y Combinator, which kind of gives a forcing function for people to either get in or get off the boat. Um, but one of the primary focuses that I would say that there's kind of a, a misunderstanding around fundraising and when you need capital and when you potentially don't is that fundraising is not something that should be automatically given to you because you have an idea. Like the notion of raising money is because you have an idea and you've achieved certain milestones that you can prove out that show that by giving me additional capital, I have the opportunity to grow by a certain percentage or by um, most investors would love to hear the word 10x each year, right? Um, and so when you, when you think about fundraising, I often think that some of the companies that have come onto market, they just assume like, well, I'm going out and I'm fundraising and nobody's giving me money. And then the, question, the really hard questions you need to ask yourself well, have you built a business around your product? Do you have proof of concept? Because investors do not really want to pay for R&D, and much of our R&D was paid for by myself and by um, the angel that gave us some small amount of capital 
um, which then after he saw some proof of concept gave us another round later um, and kind of it was an iterative process. And um, even still now, like raising money is really, really hard. I would argue that it is the most difficult job that I have. Um, it is far easier for me to interact with our customers and to talk with our customers than it is for me to like fundraise. Um, but nonetheless, it is. Well, you don't strike me as bashful. Well, so. I'm not bashful. It's not the problem. <laughs> it's just it, it is a it's a it is a difficult and it is a very trying what do they need process. To, what do they need to see? I mean, give it. I mean, you're a few years in. You've got customers. You've got a revenue stream. Yeah. You're, you're, um, they investors want to see. When you have revenue, it's tricky um, because there's certain sometimes target marks of what they think that revenue should be, and if your revenue are not at what those initial thought processes are of what their expectations think your revenue should be then you have to defend why your revenue isn't 1.5 million, like for example, if that right, was right. the case, I'm being hypothetical. Um, and so that one can be a catch 22. Profitability would be ideal. Um, investors, you're in the best position as a company if you are profitable um, and you are operating lean um, because then they're like, okay, great, they're profitable. If we give them more money, there's a high degree of confidence that they can continue to grow. But really it's about thinking about the stage of where your company is um, coming up with milestones that represent that you did this in typically 12 to 18 months, um, proving out how those all happened and showing that proof of concept and that you have attraction to take whatever your revenue is and multiply that by a certain multiplier for the following year. Uh, kind of fundamentals, okay. I guess. Well, let's finish up with a couple of questions about uh, skills. So I'll, re I'll read this one verbatim. I work with high school students who are interested in ag business and some have even witnessed a problem they want to fix. Mm. That almost sounds a little bit like you, or contribute to the solution. And when you were, so when you were in high school, mm -hmm. did you enjoy math? Did you expect to use statistics, data analysis, and be as, and problem solving as much as you, ended, as you, as you do now? Did, did you expect to put all that to work? Um, no, I am not a mathematical person by like the way in which that my brain functions. I do happen to like, statistics, I like economics, and I like data. Um, but in terms of like, my husband's an engineer, so like when I compared the two between like a mathematical mind, I am definitely not that. Um, I have always been kind of a natural problem solver, even problem solver, excuse me, even as a young person. Um, that is a trait that has kind of stayed with me throughout all of this, which I think has kind of served um, as a foundation. I think for, for high school students, um, High school students, what they look like now compared to when I was in high school is very different. These kids are like incredibly advanced and they have access to information in a way that I could not even fathom the idea of learning. Like I, I we had some um, high school students that were going to be freshmen at UC Berkeley over the summer um, that were already like computer scientists and writing in like Python, which was absolutely incredible. I didn't even know what that you could pro like software program anything as a high school student when I was younger. So um, I do think kind of fostering and feeding into that and allowing them to have a space to play, whether that be through like robotics clubs or whatever that may be, um, in order to kind of hone those skills um, and prepare them for the working world. Because there's, I, I don't think there's ever a time that's too soon to kind of try. So if you, if, if, and then one of the other questions we have is, if, so if you're a student sitting in, in the audience, would you, either prioritize uh, or, uh, you know, do you, do you view business management skills or data analytics <laughs> or human resources? Uh, all, you know, if you're the CEO, I imagine they're, they're all important, but if, yeah. if you were to say, well, if, if you can only choose one, head down this direction, that's where, that's, that's, that's gonna, uh, there, there's gonna be more demand in, Right, you know. so um, I have a sister who is a college student. She is in like her soft, sophomore or junior year. I, it's terrible that I don't know that like really well, but anyway. Um, and she just declared a major as um, a, a business major at the college of her choice. And um, when she first told me that she was going to be a business major, I, I was kind of struck. I was like, really? Why, why, were you gonna, why do you want to study business? Like, and it was general business at the time before she decided kind of a, a focus within that. And she's like, well, it seems broad enough and like I, it's broad enough that I can actually go out and figure out whatever it is I want to do. Um, and I think for many kids nowadays, and I'm like at some level kind of a kid myself, um, the idea of being very broad gives you the opportunity to do lots of things. And um, I find that more often than not, the, that broadness 
um, makes you almost overly generalized in some way and makes it difficult for you to pick a path to go down and to try. Um, and with that, I do think that it is more important nowadays in particular to focus on something and get a skill set that is specific um, because you can learn general business in like any type of fashion if that is something that is interesting to you. Um, so from my standpoint, I think it's important to be like either a data science focused person, a data analyst focused person because you can learn and take like a minor in business for example um, because I do think that that will kind of lend you well into what is going to be the next climate of our job creation where you are going to start to see the most popular jobs in the world will be data scientists. I can promise you that. And in fact, one of our advisors um, who happens to be um, Hal Varian, who's the chief economist of Google, he, um, there's a quote that I love by him. He's like, data scientists are going to be the most sexiest jobs in the next 10 years. And what were mathematic, like um, applied mathematics um, focused people that people just kind of ignored um, previously uh, are going to be the ones that are going to be in high demand for jobs. And um, I understand that may not seem sexy or interesting, but nonetheless, try to be as focused as possible in the degree of your choice and um, where you kind of focus well, on it. Okay, so we can't say data scientists will be the sexiest deal around. You hear, heard it here first, right. but you heard it here second. <laughs> so uh, so you're, 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 right, you're following the leader. Um, we'll, we'll close with, uh, you know, this issue of, uh, you know, and you look at the statistics we heard, you're going to displace uh, theoretically X amount of workers, but you're going to create right. a, a jobs t times two and uh, as you succeed and get more funding and uh, wh where, where do you envision that workforce coming? You know, t there's a lot of talk about public-private partnerships and that sort of thing. And that, right. uh, so when you think about work workforce, uh, either development or training a new workforce, to, does, it, does it ever occur to you to think, gee, I should be talking to cities or counties and people who do that type of stuff? How do you, how do you view all that in terms I of? I actually had the opportunity um, to speak with Assemblywoman Caballero on this like exact topic uh, mm -hmm. several months ago um, at her office in um, Sacramento. And um, I, I don't think that it's, in general, the Central Valley is, and like even places like the Salinas Valley that offer um, access to affordable housing, um, that offer access to kind of community type living where that is more considered more important as opposed to kind of like an individual focused society like what is San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Um, I do think that it's important for us to be giving the people that are within these communities the skill sets to be able to be part of that workforce of the future. Um, and I do think that, like, I know Fresno has spent some serious time in trying to create software developers at a lower cost because, to be frank, like, to pay an entry-level software engineer in San Francisco, you're looking at $120,000 a year, like, base, and that's with somebody who has very little skills. And that sounds like a lot of money, but you couple that with, like, $3,500 in rent and, like, everything else that comes along with it, and that paycheck starts to slowly dwindle away. Um, whereas I think there's great opportunity for some of our more rural communities um, to invest in the people that we have here, whether that starts in high school or at the community college level, um, to give them the skill sets to be employable by Taylor Farms, I'm sure, is going to be looking for statisticians and people with computer science backgrounds. Um, I know Gallo and Modesto, for example, has become kind of like a tech hub. We even have Hillmar Cheese, which is the smallest um, town of Hillmar that employs tons of people that are technical in their background and their focus. And so um, I do think it's important for people within kind of regional and city areas to be at the helm of trying to force these initiatives um, and to kind of help build up um, a successful future and foundation for their kind of constituents and their people. Um, and at the same time, give folks the opportunity to kind of boomerang that go away like me for college leave the nest and then never think that you're ever going to come back because I always wanted desperately to leave Gustine um, to then come back and now actually own a home there and split my time 50-50 between the Central Valley and San Francisco. And I, as, as um, exhausting as the drive is and um, it is for scheduling, it, I wouldn't have it any other way either. Um, and I'd love to see other kids have the same type of opportunity as me in that same type of fashion. Good. Well, I, I think uh, let's... Let's uh, thank thank Megan for joining us, and I think uh, we can 
we can all agree a pretty good objective for ag tech is how do we get more U's? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and uh, so thanks for uh, sharing your experience with us and taking the time to, it, it is in Gustine and it ain't the city, no. but uh, we, we don't, we've never ever thought Monterey County is a bad spot to spend a little time. It is definitely not. And yeah. I remember coming here as a kid, so it's, I, I'm fond of this area. Well, tr trust me when I tell you, there'll be CSUMB people waiting for you at that door as you leave. You're gonna Excellent. learn more about CSUMB. So anyway, Megan, thanks very much. Awesome, okay. thank you so much. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions, by the way. Well, that's, you know, the, uh, the, the, the value of dinner. We had a chance to prep. <laughs> right, Megan, thank you. Oh, thank you. I want to thank Mr. Donahue and Ms. Noons for a fascinating discussion. Uh, As an agricultural economist, I'm well aware of the importance of big data and how it is transforming agriculture. And so I found it an absolutely fascinating discussion and really appreciated their taking the time to be with us this morning. Uh, we'll be bringing on the next panel. And again, a uh, reminder that uh, while the panel's in discussion, please remember to keep your cell phone silent. Uh, also, uh, if you need to leave the room, please uh, be as quiet as possible. And also, uh, again, we will be collecting cards for questions for the panelists. And so there will be students coming around after about 30 minutes in to collect questions. So feel free to ask questions uh, of our panelists. Um, our panelists today are, our moderator is uh, Rosie Armstrong. Uh, the panel is Allison Bloom, Chad Foster, and Alexandria Sanchez. And the title of our panel is Careers, Energy, Sustainability, and Agriculture. And it should be absolutely fascinating. And I will go ahead and uh, provide uh, background on each of our uh, panelists and our moderators, starting with uh, Rosie Armstrong. Rosie Armstrong is Director of Workforce Development for Agriculture and Sector Partnership in the Office of Institutional Advancement at Hartnell College in Salinas. She also serves as Executive Director to Salinas Valley Regional Five Cities Board, comprised of Economic Development and City Managers of the Valley. Uh, Allison Bloom is currently the lead UX designer That's all right. Oh, there's Allison. <laughs> Allison Bloom is currently the lead UX designer at Wessex Technologies, where she heads up design, strategy, and testing of current and new software features on the Wessex uh, product roadmap. She is a Carnegie Mellon University educated design thinker with a broad array of experiences in many aspects of the tech world, from CG graphics to mobile gaming and venture capital investing. She has served as executive boards of San Francisco Ballet Encore and Environmental Media Group. Our panelist, uh, Chad Forrester, is Chief Financial Officer of Concert Power. Uh, Chad brings over 20 years of corporate finance experience to Concentric Power, excuse me. Chad previously served as CFO of Slingshot Power and VP of Finance for Solar Universe, contributing to energy independence of residential solar. And panelist Alexandria Sanchez is a sustainability manager at Taylor Farms. Previously, she worked at sustainability manager at Allham International. She has served at various agricultural advising boards, including McDonald's, Sustainability Conservation, California Water Action Collaborative, Fresno Food Systems Alliance, and Young Farmers and Ranchers. Let's give them all a round of applause, and I'm looking very much forward to. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Rosie. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, panel. You guys should be okay. I just want to thank you guys all again for being here today. It's such a diverse panel. We have Allison, who is a UX, a lead UX designer. We have Chad, who's in the finance area, and we have Alejandra, who's the sustainability manager. So. 
we're really lucky to have such a diverse panel here today. And one of the questions I really would like to ask you is, tell me more about your job, if you want to. <laughs> Excuse me. Tell us a little bit more about your job and what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll let any one of you jump into that as, as, as you like. Is mine on? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm fairly new at Taylor Farms. I just joined them in June. Um, and I was really brought on to join their sustainability department to focus more on ag and labor. Um, and I would say something that's, you know, in my previous job as sustainability manager and now in my role at Taylor Farms, it's really about finding uh, bridges between our company and what we're identifying as um, you know, somewhat as risks. So you have your physical risk, your regulatory risks, and your reputational risk, and kind of managing that in terms of agriculture and labor. Um, and also as we look in for community development, and I say like most of my job is really just starting to understand um, where Taylor Farms operates, and also I guess like in the community of like what our impacts are in terms of the environments that we're working in and what their impacts are gonna be on us as a business. Um, and so I'm still really new, and I'm focusing a lot, I think, at our manufacturing facilities and getting to know that, and then we'll be uh, more focused on, on the field. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, at, I'm the CFO of Concentric Power. Um, we build power plants for large ag users like Taylor Farms. <laughs> They're one of our customers, which we love. Um, I've been in the power industry for, for a number of years. I'm passionate about energy and helping solve a problem that every large user has, there's not enough power to go around. So at Concentric, we're looking to solve that problem by building on-site firm power plants that can serve a user's energy load and offset their need for you know, PG&E or SoCal Edison or whatever the case may be. So saving money, saving and efficiency. Yes, and efficiency. In, in, exactly. Uh, I'm Allison, I work for Wexus Technologies uh, we're uh, an energy management firm. We deal specifically with the management of electricity, water, and natural, re uh, natural gas resources. Uh, we try and do it uh, looking at, uh, in order to have our farmers save time, money, um, as well as their natural resources through our services and technologies. Um, so basically what we do is we pull in um, all the information from their, uh, their power plants, from their meters, from their pumps, from their cold storage units, all of these things, pull all that uh, information in and try to form a better picture around how they're using their energy resources so that they can make better decisions to save them money and uh, hopefully also uh, save a little water and energy along the way. Sounds like big data is going to be a theme today. <laughs> big data is a, a huge part. Um, as far as my, my own job in this, and I know you were asking me um, before this to say a little bit more about what I do yes. specifically, because uh, uh, UX design is one of these new terms that you're starting to hear um, a lot as far as um, not only in the technology industry, but also um, a lot of um, uh, jobs are in this field, and it's a fairly high uh, job market for those of you who are looking for uh, future career paths. Um, essentially, you're on the product team, and your job is to figure out um, who you're building your product for and how that product should be designed for that particular person with the idea that you're going to build a very different product for a 72-year-old man than you would a 13-year-old girl. Um, and so you spend a lot, of, it's a lot of time dealing with uh, figuring out who those customers are, uh, learning to empathize with those customers, what their pain points are, what their needs are, um, how they're going to use a, uh, a product that you might build, and then building a product for that person, testing it, um, retesting it, um, in order to make sure that you're creating as valuable a product as you possibly can for your sector. So we're, we're hearing quite a few themes here today. Uh, we've heard big data, we heard customer uh, getting to know your customer and addressing the problems, so creating platforms to address those problems. You all have extensive experience. Can you tell me a little bit more about your path and how you got here today? In your current jobs, I, I didn't mean on the highway, guys. In the rain. Um, sure, so I, I grew up in agriculture. My parents um, were farm workers and then we moved on to start farming avocados in Mexico. And so my introduction to agriculture was very international. Um, 
And then when I was in college, I went to Davis and I was studying international relations for trade and development um, with a focus on agriculture. And I think what really got me more interested in agriculture was working at the farmer's market. I was super fascinated at the different cities that I was selling products at and understanding people's, the differences in people's questions, how they were interacting with food, what, were their, what their demands were. Um, and I just saw that and how the growers that I was working for were responding. Um, I went on and I worked as a sustainability manager at Olam um, and I had a lot of great opportunities there to really start carving out what sustainability was going to look like for the company in the U.S. Um, so we worked for, I worked on dehydrated um, vegetables and spices supply chains, so in Egypt and Peru and Vietnam, so a lot of it was very smallholder focused, but I was also working with large growers here in the U.S. Um, I went on to grad school, which I just finished in June, back to Davis um, and studied agricultural development and economics. Um, and going back to data, that was a huge piece that I was interested in, was what was the gap between a lot of these sustainability certifications and demands and standards versus what was really being needed on the farm and the mismatch between that. Um, and what was driving consumer behavior uh, because ultimately you would see these standards or um, certifications that would pop up overnight or new uh, commitments by major companies that might not be informed by science but creates major shocks to food systems, not just internationally but also here in the U.S. Um, and I was interested in development, not internationally, but really here in the U.S. So Central Valley and Salinas Valley have always been communities that I've been particularly interested in. Um, they're, you know, the largest agricultural producing counties in the U.S., and particularly for California. But they also suffer a lot in terms of education um, and natural resource uh, degradation. So there's, there's missing linkages there that could happen between agriculture and the development around it. And, um, coming into Taylor Farms, I had been looking at Taylor Farms as a company for a while now. Um, I was pr super interested in what they were doing, not only at their processing facilities, but their work that they were doing here in the community, um, especially them working with large growers and having very strong partnerships. And so I wanted to take my sustainability and development um, interest and apply it here to, to California. And I feel very fortunate that I get to be here in Salinas Valley. Thank you. Yeah, so I grew up in Fresno, California, surrounded by almonds and grapes and cotton and everything else that's in the Central Valley. Um, so a passion for ag, growing up as a kid, being around it. Um, I went off to UCLA and uh, I was like, all right, I'm going to be a lawyer. I studied political science, got out, thought about going to law school, and I was like, no. I clerked and said, no, law is not for me. So I started taking finance classes online and through extension programs and got more into the business side. Um, got into real estate. I like to see things built. That's kind of my passion is actually being able to walk up and, and touch something. Um, and so got into the real estate and when the real estate downturn happened in the 2008, 2009, started to kind of change my focus towards energy, got into solar, uh, residential commercial solar, building, um, you know, for, mostly for residential, but uh, I uh, worked for a company called Solar Universe where we expanded to uh, 50 plus franchisees in 14 states. Uh, so you, I was the uh, VP of finance there. And then kind of our CEO, Brian Curse and I had gone to UCLA together and he kind of had been recruiting me and I'd helped his business plan with Concentric back in uh, you know, the early, I call it 2009, 2010, before he kind of had a proof of concept really. Um, he finally recruited me over uh, when we started working on a, a number of pro cogen projects. Um, and his focus and my passion for agriculture, he grew up in Salinas. We kind of said, let's bring energy back, let's solve a problem around power for the Salinas Valley, for Monterey County. Um, and so that's why we're here, focused, looking to create additional jobs within the area. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of new stuff coming. So it's, uh, it's really a, a great place to be. Chad, would you mind just expanding on what co-generation co Yeah, sorry. Uh, so co-gen is, it's basically, we use a natural gas fired engine. Uh, we capture the waste heat and we run a refrigeration process. So if you think of your car engine, you waste like 50% of the waste energy goes to heat that's wasted. Uh, our plants capture that waste heat, run it through a refrigeration process and are able to feed a lot of the processing plants that run big cold storage. Uh, have big demands, we're able to feed back cold ammonia, essentially, um, to those plants and help re reduce their load levels on the refrigeration side. So 
becomes more of a 90% efficient process as opposed to 45 to 50. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I won't give you the, the full story of uh, how I got into my job because uh, it's very winding and twisting. Um, if you want to know, uh, do, uh, the big lesson I guess I can, I can give to any college student is you can have many careers in your lifetime. Don't worry if you don't know what you want to do now. You can try lots of different things, I promise you. Um, but uh, I guess that the short version of the story of how I ended up in my current job, um, I always have loved making things. Making things has always been a passion of mine. Um, I've made things from uh, animated movies. My name's in the credits on such things as How to Train Your Dragon, um, Megamind, Puss in Boots at uh, DreamWorks. I worked on video games such as uh, Farmville, uh, Words with Friends, things like that. Um, but where I really found a hole uh, for myself and what I was doing, while well, I love making things, um, I was very frustrated that, especially in Silicon Valley, so much energy was being put forward into solving problems that didn't really move the needle for uh, the population as a whole, for the greater good of, of, of this earth. Um, I really wanted to be working on something that uh, was trying to solve some of the, the bigger problems that we deal with um, in our world. Um, those, everything from education to healthcare to the environment to how do we feed nine billion people on this world? Um, and so uh, I started looking for my next job um, and this company came along that was uh, working with uh, agricultural customers, you know, feeding, the, uh, feeding the world's population, very important, uh, and was trying to solve major problems in energy and water resource management, which I also thought were very complex issues. Um, and that just made me more excited than anything else I had worked on. Uh, and so that's kind of how I got into what I'm doing today. Thank you. Very fascinating. Um, wanted to ask you guys, why are energy and sustainability so important in ag? Okay. Um, we can mix it up if you want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can we take it. So if you look at a company's uh, operating expenses, one of the largest expenses they have is, is energy. Um, and so while there's ways to reduce capital costs for other things. Energy, most people get that PG&E bill, they write the check, they don't even ask a second question about it. So what we're trying to provide is a way to reduce your costs, look at your usage, there's companies like Wexus that provide a lot of data, um, and allow you to actually, allow ag processing companies to actually understand where their power is going, how they can reduce those costs, so energy, among all the other costs, whether it's labor, transportation, is another cost that can be reduced and help improve really the profitability and the competitive landscape for big companies in this, in this area. Yeah, I would just to add to what you're saying, um, you know, the way I, I couldn't agree more with what you, with what you just said, um, I'm just going to take it a step further to help explain. Um, you know, all of you in the audience, you have you know, a meter on your home and for that meter you get a bill every single month and um, when you look at that bill, if you look at your bill, I know most people don't, um, you say, okay, that's what it's gonna cost and then you just pay it. Um, where in fact there's a huge amount of data in that bill alone that if you were able to understand it, um, you would be able to call your utility company, say I'd like to change X, Y, and Z. Um, you'd be able to do things internally in your home and all of a sudden your bill could decrease by sometimes as much as 40%. Um, and But the fact that you just don't know how to read your bill because it is so dense and so complex keeps you from doing that. Now a farm has hundreds if not thousands of meters um, and hundreds if not thousands of bills coming in at multiple times during the month, uh, making it even more complex for someone uh, uh, to figure out. Um, and farmers are some of the most busy people I've ever met in my life. Um, and so this is just something they don't always have time to focus on when they do, that's, that's um, really special. Um, but then in addition to that, if they have something like solar, then the number of those bills doubles. Uh, they have you know, bills for energy that they generate as well as for energy that they use and it becomes even more complex. And so the ability to uh, work on something like that and make it simpler is very important. Yeah, and I'll just take, take pieces from both of your responses. Um, you know, especially as a food processor, Taylor Farms, like the majority of our company is in processing. And so energy is 
that's the backbone. Like we need, our entire business depends on energy. And so when you think of when you're trying to solve problems from a sustainability standpoint, you know, we do, we look at water, we look at changes in weather patterns, but we also need to look at from where all of our facilities are at, you know, we're across the US. And that's an exciting part, you know, for Nicole, my boss and myself, um, when we look at these problems, it varies from city to city and state to state how energy works. And I don't come from an energy background and just in the last few months, like trying to keep up um, and understanding how energy is so impactful for, for our business. It's really exciting. I enjoy problem solving. Um, California is especially unique because we see it not only from our energy demand, but also that it's a very quickly changing regulatory environment. And so knowing how your business is going to be sustainable, even just as it relates to regulations. Um, but through that, you know, you could look at that as that's going to be a challenge, or you can also look at that, well, now that's the perfect opportunity to innovate. And that's where when, you know, organizations like Concentric Power and, you know, them look, seeing the problems and seeing it ahead and saying, this is something, it's not just unique to Taylor Farms, it's going to be unique to an entire industry. And it's not something so small that it really does connect to something bigger when you think that Salinas Valley is very dependent on food processors. If energy costs were, you know, were so dependent on it, um, if those are continuing to rise and making it difficult for companies like us to operate here, it really has other economic effects um, throughout the community and in the industry. When, so it's all, it's all linked together and that's, um, it's an exciting thing to be focusing on at Taylor Farms. I'm really, it's something that's new to me. Um, and yeah, it's like I said, it changes from city to city and state to state that we're operating in. Yeah, the, I mean, the cost per kilowatt hour has gone up 20% in the last 12 months, and Taylor's been great at adopting. You guys are on the forefront of, you've got wind on your sites, mm -hmm. you've got solar on your sites, you guys, which are 100% renewable, um, and so you guys are really proactive in becoming more and more sustainable, which is And amazing. we don't see it as a... Um, as a competitive, like food safety, it's something like for, yeah, for Gonzalez, for example, we were the first ones to you know, put in a wind turbine, and now there's been three additional wind turbines that have gone up in the city of Gonzalez since then. Um, and so we really want to push the, you know, be a leader and push the industry and share these best practices because you know, they, they are new adoptions and sometimes you are taking a risk, but overall, um, if you have to create a demand for these certain infrastructures to support you know, a new demand for like clean energy on the grids from what I'm starting to, to learn. And if you have more more food processors that are willing to also take on these investments, then um, hopefully the infrastructure will also start to be built around it to support those. I'd like to ask Alejandra um, just a follow-up question. Uh, Taylor, Farm ha Taylor Farms, excuse me, has a huge customer base. How do you communicate your sustainability efforts to your consumers? And is that important? It is. It's it's extremely important, um, and it really depends. You know, everyone, all, you know, customers are going to have different demands and what their questions that they're asking. But it's really important that we communicate that we we understand our role in the food system, and we also understand our role in this ag community. So a lot of times when people talk about water and sustainability, it's really focused on farm, and Taylor Farms is not farming, we're more focused on the food processing side, but it doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to also do our part. And so we realize that our growers are facing challenges for energy and water demands um, in, these, in, in this area. So it's also incumbent on us to make sure that we're utilizing our water as efficient as possible in our facilities as well, and energy. Um, essentially, it's, you know, it's two straws in the same cup. So the water discussion isn't necessarily always just have to be on farm. It should also be happening in house at the processing sites. Thank you for saying that. That, that is so important. So thank you. Um, just as a housekeeping matter, I, I failed to remind you guys, uh, please keep your questions coming because we will be getting to the Q&A actually um, pretty shortly. <laughs> so um, I did have some follow-up questions for you guys. We've talked a lot about uh, earlier during the fireside chat about some of the skills required for our jobs today and tomorrow. And if you could, could you tell me what the jobs look like today in your respective industries and what you might see, how, what you might see in 10 years from now is in terms of the jobs? Or can you oh, communicate yeah. to our students? Yeah. I mean, I'd piggyback off 
just the theme of today, and I know what Keith's being said, data. Um, you have to be comfortable with numbers, even if you think that your job isn't going to um, cross numbers in the future, if it's not your strong point. It really, it just, it, it's important to help you communicate the story to make your argument. Um, but also, there's data, and then there's knowing what data to collect. So especially in the world of sustainability, there's a significant amount of standards and certifications out there, and yet still the conversations at, at conferences are, we need more data. And it's not so much that you need more data, but you should have had someone asking the right questions on what data would actually need to be collected. So I think Megan did, was a fantastic keynote speaker and hit on a lot of those points that she was seeing that a lot of startups were shooting out ideas you know, that were way out of the ballpark and were not even hitting on what growers really needed. So something as simple as just knowing, knowing what the problem is and her going and asking customers, what is your problem, that's, that's important so that you understand how to use data. Data is out there, it's everywhere, but if you don't know how to use it, it's useless. And so knowing how to problem solve and put these pieces together is really important. Um, so like hitting on internships, um, as she was saying, like you know, focus on something specific because that does set you out and it allows you to see the connections where other people might not be seeing them and, and helping bridge those gaps. I'm just looking at, talking from Concentric's perspective, we've probably got 20 open positions right now um, and it ranges from anywhere and, and I love the data analytics and that's a piece, but we've got software engineers, we've got a big platform that drives the energy management of all these big systems. Um, we need electrical engineers. Um, we need people in the field doing fabrication and welding and assembly um, mechanics. We, we run big 16, 20 cylinder engines, so we're hiring mechanics to work in the field and service our engines on a daily, monthly, weekly basis, whatever it is. So we're looking to create a big infrastructure of diff a lot of different jobs, not just data or tech here in the Valley. So Allison, um both Alejandra and um, Chad have talked about some of the hard skills for those positions. Can you address some of maybe the soft skills that students would need to meet the needs of these positions? I can. Um, I, I do reiterate that uh, those hard skills are also very important. Um, uh, while I'm a designer, I'm doing data visualization. So my ability, I, I did very well in math in school, and my ability to understand spread, what's happening in spreadsheets, have those conversations, gives me the ability to take all of that data, because my job is to make it as easy to understand as possible. Um, so I wouldn't be able to do that if I would, wasn't able to have the right types of conversations with um, our data scientists, with our analysts, with our engineers, all of that's very important. But on the softer side, there are numerous skills that are incredibly important. Um, in my job, uh, empathy is probably one of the biggest things um, out there. Uh, you know, we go, I go out every single week and I talk to farmers. Um, I've done hundreds, if not thousands by now, um, interviews I, over the phone, in the field, um, and uh, I, I go and I, I listen to their problems and I also listen to them telling me what they think I need to improve on in, uh, you know, my own products that I'm, I'm designing and my, you know, I would be dead in the water if I said, no, you're wrong. Um, my, what I've done is perfect and beautiful. Um, you know, I have to say, yes, tell me more. Tell me how I can improve. Tell me what are the things that you wish were slightly better. Because if I'm able to do that, um, you know, take it away from myself and really listen to what they're saying, then I'm actually able to take all that, take that data, and build a better product for them. So the ability to listen, uh, to be able to then take uh, what people have said and then take a step back, because they don't always say exactly what they mean, mm -hmm. um, it's, and say, okay, they're saying this, but why are they saying that? Well, it looks like this is the, actually the problem that they, they need solved. Um, then you can go back and, and you can say, I've thought a lot about what you've said. Would something like this help? Um, and I can't tell you the number of times where, um, you know, I've gone to farmers and, I, and they've said, oh my God, uh, yet another tech company who's coming out and thinks that they, they know how to do things better than, than I know how to do it, and, or I just don't have time to learn how to use another piece of technology, I'm just too busy. And you say, yeah, I, I totally get that, um, let me show you how this works. Um, and they take one look at it and they go, oh, I know exactly how to use this. And the only reason they, uh, I can brag about that and say, yes, they know exactly how to use it is because we spent so many hours testing, listening to feedback, trying to make it as simple for our customers as possible. 
So empathy, I would say, is, is a uh, very, very big skill, not only for my job. Um, we have um, all of our sales positions. Sales is a very important job. You know, as our uh, keynote speaker was saying, you know, she's going out every single day and going and talking to farmers. Um, and uh, sales is something that, quite frankly, terrifies me. Um, I, I, I applaud anyone who can do it. Um, you know, the ability to go out and listen to them. They don't want someone who's going to be flashy and say, you know, hey, come and buy my cool new product. They want someone who's going to sell them a solution, which is going to make their jobs easier. Um, and so uh, the ability to go in and be able to have those types of conversations with people, relate to people uh, in a way that, you know, they feel like they can have a relationship with you, that they can trust you. There's so many salespeople going around who, uh, I'm sure Alejandra can tell stories about, you know, coming, meeting with someone and being like, I don't trust a single word coming out of your mouth. Um, so I would say those are very important skills as well. Um, and then uh, even just internally within your job, the ability to work with your fellow uh, uh, employee, um, you know, that ability to, uh, you know, you're all trying to work towards a greater vision, being able to work with all of the stakeholders within your company um, in order to uh, work together. So taking bits from each group, making sure that all of that is coordinated. One of the biggest uh, jobs in demand right now in Silicon Valley are called um, product managers. Um, and you know, product managers, really a huge part of their job is coordinating with all of those different groups from the uh, data scientists to the developers to the designers to the sales teams to the marketing teams to uh, kind of herald a product through from beginning to end. Um, and that takes listening to people, that takes organizing, um, all of these soft skills that uh, cannot be discounted. So let's talk about engaging those soft skills um, in, in regards to our students and engaging our new workforce. Can you t each touch on what opportunities you offer students in terms of internships or job opportunities, mentorship in your respective fields? Yeah, we, do, we typically do internship programs every summer, but I think we're going to expand. I know here it can be seasonal or throughout the year, and we're looking to offer opportunities to work shadow um, internships, um, really just to increase the knowledge. I mean, I think you can get a lot of education in the classroom, but for a lot of these jobs, it's real in the trenches sort of experience. It's going to round out your, your educational experience and really make you more valuable uh, when you become a professional. And um, I just before we, uh, excuse me, um, also just as a second part of that question, and sorry I didn't mention this before, can you also explain if you also um, completed an internship experience as well and if that motivated, if that created uh, support for your job today? Um, I did, well, Back when I was in college, we didn't have so many intern <laughs> internships programs. Um, I think now it's a lot, uh, it's a lot more prevalent. Um, I think getting experience, whether it's multiple internships, a lot of people, I mean, I remember being in college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, so getting experience across many different, you know, either job specifics or uh, different, uh, different industries, like get the, as much experience as you can get um, and take the opportunity of a, three-month internship to say, all right, I, this interests me, or it doesn't, and you can move on to something else. Yeah, um, at Taylor Farms, we, we offer internships, um, and we're also very engaged with, I know, like CSU Monterey Bay, Hartnell College, and several of the community colleges in the area. And, you know, one of the big reasons is that, as we understand that there, you know, you have to bridge the gap between what the industry is in demand for and just expecting education to meet that without communicating what the needs are and working with them early on. And, you know, that's one of the beauties of internships is, you know, you spend a, you can spend two, your first two years of college in a classroom, and then as soon as you go out and you're actually getting hands-on experience, you're asking completely different questions than you were those first two years. And so it really, you know, it makes you get a better experience from what you're taking in in the classroom and starting to challenge that, you know, not not agreeing with everything or just, you know, pushing back, asking new questions. Um, and all of those are really beneficial. When I was in college, I mean, there was internships and I worked several jobs and I do think that every single job I had has led me to be good at my job today. Um, from doing a lot of like research positions, not because I wanted to go into research, but because I knew I wanted to have an appreciation and an understanding enough of science 
that I could take it into practice as a pracademic instead of just an academic. Um, and, and I know that that was something that was going to be really va valuable. And it's you know going back to soft skills communication that um, being able to translate that science into practice is is extremely helpful. Um, and you know knowing how to work with different audiences. So whether I was working on the farm, um, sales at a farmer's market, I spent three summers working in a window factory. So I understand what it's like to work with employees and the culture of factories um, and building, you know, when we're building programs such as our zero waste program, it's really important that we engage every single one of our employees at the facilities. And our Gonzalez facility is a zero waste program, I'm currently working on one here um, in Salinas. And so all of these soft skills have played actually a really big part in my, in my job. And I know Nicole and I both know that you know as sustainability touches every part of, of Taylor Farms that you know we're having to navigate talking with our engineers at the plant and then talking to you know Brian or Chad at Concentric and then going back and talking to senior management and then going back and figuring out how it fits with regulations. So you're needing to pull very just like the most important pieces from those conversations and put them together. Um, because they might not have the opportunities to sit in the same room all the time. And we're fortunate enough that our job allows us to have those conversations with very diverse stakeholders and be able to make those connections where they might not traditionally be. Um, I had lots of internships uh, <laughs> during, during school. Um, and uh, I thought every single one of them was valuable um, in one way or another. I think um, if I was to give advice today on the best way to use your internships, I would say the first thing is come in with uh, some sort of goal in mind. Uh, you know, is your go and they don't have to be you know, moonshot goals. Uh, for me, some of my goals were um, use this internship to decide if you want a job like this. Use this industry to use the internship to decide if this is the right industry for you. Um, as well as some more ambitious goals like use this internship in order to get a job at this company one day. Um, and that will really help you figure out how you want to use your time while you're there. Um, I would say while you're um, in your internship, um, try and find um, as many people to have conversations with as possible. It's, uh, you know, if you're lucky, your internship will give you, you know, really interesting projects to work on. Uh, but a lot of internships are also you know, getting people coffee and sitting in on meetings and just listening. And all of those are valid. Um, it's just how you use your time there. So the best internships I had were the ones where um, you know, I reached out um, or I uh, had someone help me reach out to various other employees within the company um, to do informational interviews, uh, whether they were coffees or lunches or just a, a five minute walk. Um, always then to follow up with those people afterwards um, to try and get more information and stay in contact with those people. Um, I would say those are probably the most valuable things. Um, as for Wexis, uh, we did have two interns this past summer uh, working on some very real projects for us, um, which was exciting. Um, and I think it gave them a, a real insight in not only what it's like to work in ag tech, but what it's also like to work in a startup, um, which is very different from what it's like to work at a very large company, um, as well as what it's like to work in tech. Um, and I think that was a really exciting experience for them. And we'll hopefully do it again next summer. So I have some key questions from students just following up on what you just, what you all just said. Um, would your companies be open to apprenticeships? So more on the job training. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, we definitely are open to those ideas. Um, you know, it really depends on, uh, you know, being at a startup, you, you're moving very, very quickly. And so there are times where uh, we're very excited to take on new people and to train them up. You know, we did that with these interns this summer, um, and I'd say you know, the things that they knew by the end of their summer uh, you know, was you know, just threefold what they thought they would come in with. Um, and then there are times where you, uh, in a startup you have to move very fast and you have to have people who have lots of experience, and it just depends from day to day. Okay. Yeah, we're definitely open for apprenticeships, especially in the field where we have a lot of certified employees that there's a lot of trainings and a lot of hours that are required to gain the you know the qualifications so um, it's it's key um, you know we're in tech technology but we still build things and there's still a lot of certifications and still a lot of training that for anyone that's just getting into it needs to go through just to be able to qualify for that position 
So multiple certifications, does that mean multiple types of apprenticeships as well? It could, it could follow one after the other. Um, just depends on, on which direction you want to go. Okay, great. And actually, I have a specific question for Alejandra here. Uh, besides water and energy, can you talk about other aspects of Taylor Farms, how they incorporate sustainability, waste diversion, transportation, and packaging? So yeah, so waste is uh, a really big focus of Taylor Farms. Again, I'll, because the majority of our business is in the processing facilities, that's one of the reasons. But also the reason is that you know you have to go through these learning experiences in-house before being really able to give advice to others, even if that's growers or other processors. And so waste um, is a really big focus. We have our zero waste facility in Gonzales, and that was an 18-month program where it took training all of our employees um, to on setting up you know new waste streams working with the local recycling centers and it's initiative that we've now rolled out across all of our u.s facilities so we have one program that's already started with the trainings happening in salinas um two actually in salinas and then now expanding it to some of our other u.s facilities um as well as packaging we work very closely with some of our major customers um, that also puts us in a very good position we have very good relationships with our growers, but we also have direct and strong relationships with customers such as Walmart, um, you know, the Costco's. And so even pushing up ideas to them um, on what we see as improvements in packaging, if there's, you know, partnerships that we can go in on in terms of labeling on the packaging, um, if there's uh, improvements that we could make with our suppliers for certain, uh, you know, how they package what gets sent into the plant, so like wax corrugated boxes, switching out those, finding new vendors. We're you know, just like everything else, you have to create a demand in wax corrugated boxes or something that are used, you know, by all food processors. And so being able to have these types of solutions and putting these problems out there, um, that's, I feel like, one of our big contributions as well. Um, and then even, I guess, like for sustainability, we also see, you know, community and education is a huge part of that. Um, for this industry to, to be sustainable, here, you have to have education growing at the same rate as technology. You know, you could have technology or you can have, like you were saying, um, you still need people that are going to be able to build, um, you know, these large pieces of equipment or, or electrical engineers and those, you know, so still investing in those types of parts as well. So we're in 2018. Mm -hmm. If we were looking at sustainability in the year 2040, what would it look like to you guys? Do you have a vision of <laughs> what you would want it to look like versus what you think it will look like? So, <laughs> um, well, I know from an energy perspective, there's a big push to be 100% renewable by okay. 2050. So there's a lot of room for improvement um, across just from energy. There's advancements in, in battery technology. Um, solar, wind, um, what we do. Um, I know we're looking at projects that we, instead of running our engines on natural gas, it'll be run off uh, energy or waste from food, food waste. So it'll be biogas. So we can supply our engines with any sort of fuel necessary. So that would be a, a very much renewable aspect. And it would help uh, people like Taylor with their waste because there's a lot of food or product waste um, from trimmings and all that sort of stuff. So. I would say we're going to get a lot better um, at uh, using a predictive analytics mm -hmm. in order to make uh, more educated decisions about uh, you know, how we farm, um, when we farm, what we farm, all of these different types of things um, are going to come into play, uh, whether it be you know, how much water we use, um, to uh, what are the most popular crops to grow or varieties of crops to grow, um, and then how we go about using those resources to make our yield as, to make the yield as, as strong as you can, um, I think is going to be very important. And I'd, I'd just piggyback off Chad's, as yeah. I think you'll see, hopefully, a lot more of these closed loop systems because yeah. biogas seems like such a, it's such an obvious thing, yet it's not in, you know, it's not the majority of practice when it really could be and, and should be. So it's like figuring out how to do that. That's such a, it seems so simple, yet it's not the most adopted thing as you, right. I'm sure you could agree on. Um, 
And that's not, not just in California, that's everywhere. I mean, food waste is a huge problem uh, globally, but it's also something that requires a lot of local solutions. We've gone through the experiences of seeing, you know, when people ask, like, how, do you have a recycling program or do you think I could have a zero waste or a recycling program? And I think your first response is like, well, where are you located? You know, Celine, I feel I'm already seeing the differences between Monterey County and how we manage waste streams and the, the options that we have as, as a business here uh, versus my experiences even living in the Central Valley. Um, you would have, and that goes to say you create this demand so that hopefully, you know, on the public side or government also responds by supporting industry for infrastructure, that it's not just a private sector problem or only a private sector solution. Um, it needs to be a, a partnership between the two. And I think that hopefully we're starting to move in that direction where um, you'll start to see that, yeah, that relationship so that you start to have more of these closed loop systems. And so Alejandra, can I expand on that a little bit yeah. um, or ask you to expand on that a little bit? I know you worked extensively uh, in Fresno County with the Food Safety Alliance. Can you tell the audience a little bit more about your work there? It was uh, Food Systems Alliance. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, so Food Systems Alliance, um, that was a really great initiative or organization that it pulled people from the public health department, um, from food processors, uh, nutritionists, uh, economic development, and really just trying to understand, again, yeah, a lot of these closed loops on when you introduce something, um, like let's even just take the drought, for example. When the drought hit Fresno, it wasn't something that just affected the farm, it affected labor. Um, it affected, and not just labor, like again, not just labor on the farm, but even as simple as the thing is like the plastic trays that go for transplanting tomatoes, um, logistics, it, you know, it has all these ripple effects. And so that was a great way where I felt like Fresno was trying to think of things more in a systems way. Um, and understanding like from housing, uh, you know, how, what do we do for affordable housing so that we do have more, um, you know, people that Fresno is a more of attractive place, especially for talent, um, that when people are going to college that they're still coming back to the Central Valley. So the Food Systems Alliance focused on several parts, but it was very like systems thinking for uh, community development around agriculture because it knew that agriculture was a huge part of its community. Thank you. Quite a few questions here, so <laughs> just want to make sure we can get through them. Uh, what is the future for the energy sector? What does it look it, like? It's it's a number of different things. There's, you know, you've got the renewables, which are growing day by day, year by year, per, you know, big percentage growth. You've got, you know, the way we look at it is that, um, you know, the wind doesn't blow 24 hours a day, the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day. You still need a firm base of power, which is what Concentric provides. Um, and it supports and encourages the adoption of renewables by providing that base of power that you need at midnight when these guys are operating full, full load or, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, but there's, there's gonna be a lot of innovation, there's gonna be a lot of, you know, everything's gonna become more efficient, so I think as the energy demands grow, it's it's going to be a there'll be a, a lot more better solutions for. Does anyone else want to talk yeah. about? Yeah, and I mean, and just like what you were saying, yeah. like firm firm power, like we we recognize that. That's why at the Gonzalez facility, it's a portfolio of all of those different energy sources. It's not just renewable, but we also have the cogen, and the cogen is also something that you know, we look at, does, does that make sense for other facilities? Does batteries, you know, does storage make sense for other facilities? Um, and knowing that, you know, you can generate all this power and there's gonna be times where we have peak demands, if we were able to store it, that would be able to save us cost and not utilize it, you know, not have to use it from the grid. Um, so those are also solutions that we're, that we're having to look for. And I think it's bringing them, um, within our own four walls of operation instead of being so dependent externally. I think we're starting to take a lot of that on ourselves and yeah. Yeah, you're starting to see a lot of trains around uh, really uh, localizing mm -hmm. energy, um, not only for you know, farms and uh, companies taking on, you know, building their own solar arrays and wind turbines and, and things like that, but also um, uh, we're moving from systems where you have uh, large utility companies to locally owned utility companies. Yep. That's becoming much more of a trend, um, which allows uh, local communities to really focus on what matters to them. Uh, a lot of them focus on uh, renewables or making it cheaper for their local customers to use energy. Um, 
uh, whatever the focus and important values are for that particular community. Well, I have another question. Um, it's in regards to sustainability. Is carbon sequestration a topic of conversation in sustainability? It is, and I mean, you know, especially in agriculture, um, it's, you know, I'm, apologize that I'm so new to Taylor Farms that I'm not really sure what, what that conversation looks like with our growers, um, but it's, I mean, I was, I was at Davis for undergrad and for graduate school. It's definitely a focus that we have in so much of our, of our academics, um, understanding how to take that more to uh, a lot of the farming communities in, in California especially, but it's, yes, it's a, it's a part of sustainability. And could you just briefly expand on what it is for the remainder of the, for the audience as well? So to make sure that I understand <laughs> it, um, it's, uh, yeah, to make sure, let me make sure if I can actually repeat it back. Uh, pretty sure that it is, like, you'll have certain... Do you want me to do it? Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> uh, carbon sequestration, uh, we have, we, everything on this earth is made out of carbon. Um, and uh, the more resources we use, the more carbon um, is released into our atmosphere, into our oceans, um, everywhere into this world, um, which is what causes things such as climate change. Um, and one of the big conversations that gets had is around how do we take some of that carbon and keep it from being released out into our atmosphere in order to slow down climate change. Um, there are lots and lots of solutions, uh, both technical as well as things as simple as planting trees. Thank you. Good. I want to go back to college since we're here at CSUMB. So some questions specific um, as you were in college. Can you tell us how you engaged in networking opportunities? Um, so uh, I'm a, a fairly shy person. And uh, so networking events such as this are <laughs> terrifying to me. Um, I, will, I would often, I would go to them with the, the best of intentions to go and, and meet people and get business cards and, and set up um, lunches and calls and all these things. And I, I would walk in and get overwhelmed um, and, you know, kind of pretend to be on my phone. Um, <laughs> And as I got older and became more savvy, I realized that that's only one form of networking. Um, and it's, it's a great one. And if you are good at it, I bow down to you. It is not a skill that I have. Um, uh, other networking can be as simple as uh, going to your own network, the people who know and care about you, um, and saying, this is what I want to do with my life, or this is the thing that I, I am interested in learning more about. Do you know anyone who could help me? And I, I was overwhelmed by A, how much people wanted to help me um, and cared about trying to make my future happen, and B, how many people they happened to know that might be able to get me one step further on that path. And they would give me an email address or they would send a, an email introduction and I would say, can I take you to lunch? Can I take you to coffee? And doing just that one-on-one -on -one was so much less intimidating for me and got me a, uh, for me, got me a lot farther along the path that I wanted to go. Um, so I, I would say you'd be surprised by how far your own network or there are your friends' networks can get you. Awesome. I think networking events are great. Um, some, some advice, I guess, because you can, there's, Depends on the theme of the network event or what's being talked about, but if you go in with kind of a plan, um, do some research on who the attendees are, who's gonna be there, come with some questions that you have in mind that can draw out a conversation. Um, know a little bit about the companies, like you'll learn a lot and the objective is not to meet everyone that's there, it's maybe to meet five or 10 people that can either help you or you can learn something from that you can use in the future, so. I think definitely putting in the time to, to, you know, to look into who's going to be there, a little bit about their background, and it's something that I, you know, I'll still do in my career is work backwards. So if I think of dream jobs, um, and I really don't really know so much about what they do, but I'll read, or you, know, you can look at positions on LinkedIn, and you kind of work backwards from there. It's like, what is the skills that they're asking for? Um, where am I at today versus how do I get to that dream position? that's executive maybe five, 10 years from now. And then when you're at networking events, 
you know, kind of having more, you know, having more informed questions and those informational interviews, I think, are really valuable. Thank you. Um, just want to stay in college a bit. Uh, because you know how we all look forward to that interview with the employer, our dream employer of our choice. Um, can you give our audience some advice, like some key tips when they're going to interview at Taylor, at Concentric, at uh, Wex, uh, Wexis? What are some key things that you look for? I mean, go for it. <laughs> I think going back, um, you know, Someone that's really, you know, they've taken the time to, to research us. Uh, they've taken the time to really look into the position that they're particularly applying for and making the con helping us make the connection between their resume and the position. What's going to make them stand out? Like, it's, everything's on paper, but I, this is maybe me just personally, but I really want to hear how you've thought about um, your experience um, more in a, like a reflective way and how you actually think that you're going to, you're going to put these these skill sets and your experience into practice. Um, and that's true of really, of, of any position. Um, but going in and really, yeah, just having done your research first, uh, and that sounds simple, but you'd be surprised that that's not always the case. So that's extremely valuable in you helping us be able to make those connections between you and that position. And showing that you have an idea of what growth hopefully looks like for you. So. Personally, when I was looking for a job the first time out of college and even out of grad school, um, I looked at it, I was phrased that I was looking at it almost like a partner. Um, I wanted to be with an organization for a while. I was hoping that it was a right fit for both of us, that they wanted me just as much as I was going to want them or vice versa, that I was going to bring something that I thought unique was to the relationship and they were going to bring something that was unique and I was going to be there for a while. It sounds like dating. It's like dating. <laughs> It was like going on, on dates when you were doing these job interviews to make sure that you don't want to move everywhere, um, you know, be moving every six months or a year and starting, and I want to make sure that I give um, the, you know, the organization or the relationship a fair chance. Uh, and so I was at my last organization for almost five years, uh, and that's how I hope to be here with Taylor as well. Yeah, I think in the <laughs> day and age of the technology that we have today, there's, and having seen hundreds of resumes in the last two months, people are just pushing buttons and sending resumes for jobs that they're, they're not even qualified for or even maybe interested in. Um, so be focused on your, on your job search and then on your resume or your LinkedIn profile, make sure you have, you can back up what you put on there. Like we've interviewed people that couldn't even support what they had on there, so that's an automatic disqualification. On the flip side, if you want to get into something that's new and you may not have the experience, like it's okay to be open and upfront about it, um, as long as you're willing to learn and, and maybe it's take a class, a night class, or an online class, or, or whatever it may be. Like, employers will respect that, and I mean, I, I know that we do, so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I reiterate everything that uh, <laughs> my fellow panelists have said. Um, in addition to that, I would say uh, some of the big things that we look for specifically at Wexus, um, we look a lot at um, their passion for what we're doing, seeing if there's an alignment. If it, you know, we don't want to be working with someone who's just coming in for a paycheck. Uh, you know, we want someone who has a genuine interest in the actual material. Um, we look at their grit. Um, you know, do they? You know, have they? They worked hard to uh, get where they are today to overcome things. Um, you know, that tells you a lot about you know, on those days where. You know, there's some really, really tough problem, and you know you're just gonna have to slog through it. You know, are they gonna have that endurance uh, to get there? Um, and then personal growth. Uh, you know, how motivated are they to learn things on their own? To uh, you know, go that extra mile to uh, get a, an additional certification or to. Uh, go out and uh, try learn new skills. Those are all things that we look for. That tells you a lot about the character of the person that you're going to be working with on a day to day. So, uh, second one thing. Um, yeah, I think that, especially in the ag industry, it's it's a quickly changing industry. You know, industry to be in. Um, every day there's new challenges. There's something as as it sounds simple, but as, as weather. You know, and then the crop manager's calling the facility and saying, okay, we might have to move from this field and we weren't expecting to go into this field and now we can't go to that field. And so you're moving a lot of pieces and there's not a syllabus anymore. Um, 
and you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and having that type of grit and passion to go um, answer questions that don't, have, don't necessarily have the answer already laid out for you. And a lot of agriculture is that. And when you think of sustainability, we're talking about the future. Um, you know, you, it's, you're constantly going into uncharted waters and you gotta be comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> so it sounds like the internship yeah. It can play a key role in uh, increasing your comfortabil yeah. comfortability. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a kind of a follow-up question for a, uh, from st a student here that graduated a few years ago. How can our students contact you guys? I'll be around afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, LinkedIn is great. Uh, I'll be here afterwards as well. I'll give out my business card to anyone who asks. Um, and uh, I guess anyone who... Uh, if you go to Lisa or Dennis or anyone, they all have my contact information and they can give it away freely as well. Um, and, and we, you know, we post our positions online. Um, we're, we're pretty active at a lot of the community events. So I think, you know, if you're doing your research and you kind of have an idea of like if marketing is something that's of interest to you and even if you're, you know, you're not totally job hunting yet, even walking the floor sometimes at conferences or like PMA, just to start getting comfortable and start putting pieces together is super valuable. Um, and that's, that's a networking event like right there. <laughs> so they, so students can get some key time with yeah. you or somebody else from Taylor, yeah. just right there. And starting to see even like the changes from one year to the next of what companies are saying, how they're presenting themselves at different conferences. I know that even, you know, after being in the industry for eight years, like it's every year that I've gone, it's always, it's always been different. And that's exciting. Great. Uh, gonna go back to sustainability, if you don't mind. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions on sustainability. Okay. We have about sure. one minute at this point, so. Uh, do you think ag is held to an unfair standard when it comes to sustainability? Ag is expected to slow down climate change and fix the damage all industries have contributed to. So do you think there's an unfair standard happening? I don't know if it's an unfair standard, but um, I do feel that we definitely get, we definitely get challenged. Um, the far, you know, we wake up every day and we're usually the, the villain. Um, and we're, you know, whether it's in a regulatory environment or reputational, and it's something that's extremely difficult to navigate, but um, agriculture is a huge part of development in, in, at every level, from a local level to international, how economies develop. So it's really incumbent on agriculture to get it right so that other parts of the community can also develop in a healthy manner. So whether that's from the actual products that you're producing or how you're growing them, um, we do have a very big role. Not, that's not to say that we should be doing it on, on our own. That's why I think that there's a lot of room for support from government, mm -hmm. um, and but making letting them know exactly what it is, what the support is, making that clear is also really important. And so, um, yes, we're hold, we're held to a very high standard, but I understand why. But I do hope that um, that's where you know we're with, when we're able to do good, other people are also able to benefit. Other industries are able to benefit, and I starting I think you're starting to see that industries that aren't traditionally for agriculture are also coming in and helping us, and they're seeing that. And technology is a, a perfect example of that. So an immense opportunity for a partnership. It sounds like. Yeah. I want to thank the panel. It looks like we're out of time today, so I want to thank Alejandro Sanchez, Chad Forrest, and Allison Bloom for your thoughts and your insight today, and we look forward to continuing conversations um, during our networking opportunity, and again, thank you for being here today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And again, I would like to thank our panel, Rosie, Allison, Chad, and Alejandria for uh, just a very interesting discussion on careers in agriculture and uh, energy and sustainability. And uh, we'll be beginning in a moment or two with the next panel. And, uh, and this would be a good time to, again to remind everyone that uh, for the next panel, uh, I would uh, like to remind you that uh, we will have question cards available 
And so, you know, as you're listening to the next panel, uh, please, if you have a question, write it down, and there will be students who will come around and uh, pick those up and supply it to the moderator. Also remind you that uh, uh, for uh, uh, the restrooms, or th through the door and to the left if you need to use them. If you do have to get up and leave the ballroom, please be as quiet as possible, uh, so not to disturb the next panelist. Also, um, uh, let's see, uh, cell phones, make sure that they're turned off. And so again, not to disrupt the panelists' conversation. And uh, we'll begin beginning in a moment. Thank you very much. What's that? Okay. Um, before we begin the next panel, I would like to again thank our sponsors. As you can see, they're listed up there on the slide. Uh, the Grower Shippers Association Foundation, uh, California State University Monterey Bay, Blue Tech Valley, and California State University Monterey Bay College of Business and Thrive. Again, we appreciate both their cash and in-kind contributions to make this public forum on uh, education and careers in agriculture possible today. And again, this is a collaborative uh, venture by both the uh, uh, California State University Monterey Bay and the Grower Shippers Association Foundation. And uh, we've been putting on these forums since 2006. And uh, without further ado, I am going to go ahead and introduce the next panel, which is Careers, oh, Careers Technology and Agriculture. Our moderator is Abby Taylor Silva, panelist is Jackie Vaquez, uh, Josh Ruiz, and Jennifer Clark. And I will provide you a brief introduction for both, beginning with Abby. Abby Taylor Silva is our moderator today. Abby Taylor Silva is the Vice President of Policy and Communication at the Grower Shipper Association of Central California. She's a member of the Rotary Club of Salinas, the past president of the Central Coast Tax Ag Tax Force, past president of California Women for Agriculture Salinas Valley Chapter, food safety director to statewide California Women for Agriculture, and executive board member to the Salinas Valley Chamber of Commerce. Jackie Vaquez is the Director of Berry Operations for Northern California District of Sundance Berry Farms, also known as Andrew and Ann Williamson. She has a background in agriculture for 14 years, working her way up from assistant to operations. Jackie has served as a member of the Board of Directors on the Grower Shipper Association Foundation. Josh Ruiz is Vice uh, President of Ag Operations of the Church Brothers Farms. Alongside of his team, he is responsible for all aspects of farming and harvesting operations in the United States. Josh is currently thinking about the next generation of harvest, growing, and methods to improve the current operations. While he is passionate about all crops, his most recent focus has been on the automation of broccoli harvesting. Our uh, next panelist is Jennifer Clark. Jennifer Clark is the Executive Director of California Leafy Greens Research Board, which oversees the California Leafy Greens Research Program. Until recently, Clark was Vice President of Food Safety and Regulatory Compliance with Steinbeck County Producers, Steinbeck Country Producers. Her focus over the last eight years is on food safety and labor compliance. 
Clark worked closely with growers, harvesters, and retail customers. So let's give them a big round of applause, and I'll, then I'll turn it over to Adam. Good morning, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me fine? No. no. Is that better? Check, check. Check, check. OK, I'm going to keep talking. So good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to have you here. I have the great opportunity, generally, to work with everyone up on this panel at some point or another due to the different issues that I get to work in. So it's nice to be here with you today. We're going to go ahead and get started with Jennifer? Um, right, so Leafy Greens Research Board, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, we essentially collect assessments from Leafy Greens handlers, and that money then is used for the research projects. So we typically work with our UC Davis uh, farm advisors and specialists, and also USDA researchers, um, primarily the ones that are housed um, in Salinas on the Alisal um, USDA research station, in a nutshell. Can everyone hear me? I don't think we can. Can we? I'll just keep talking. <laughs> so I am responsible for day-to-day -day operations of um, our berry op operations in the Northern California. It's um, with growing partners, um, small investments, and wholly owned operations. It's around 600 acres. Um, there's strawberries, all, all berries, pretty much. Um, I handle budgeting, labor, innovation, um, profit and loss is all my responsibility. Um, harvester, recruitment, field operations. So my day-to-day -day is on the farm as well as the business side. And uh, my, my role within the company is uh, managing the all aspects of ag operation for Church Brothers Farms here in Salinas. So uh, seed all the way through harvest, uh, uh, growers, uh, all of that that goes into the farming as well as the uh, 700 field staff employees that we uh, use every day to harvest our crops. So any, any aspect of all of that. So my next question for our panelists is to tell us a little bit about the path that led to your current position. But I also want to note, I gave a talk at Hartnell recently, and one of the things that I was sure to touch on is all the times I said, yes, yes, I will do that, even if it wasn't my job even if it maybe seemed menial at the time, even if I didn't really know how to do it. So as you tell us your path, can you also tell us of the times you said yes? Um, so full disclosure, Abby and I talk about this kind of stuff all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and really, I, out of college, I, I needed to work, right? Like I had student loans, I was paying, I was on my own paying rent, so I really took the first job I could find, and that was um, with a small vineyard and winery, and I took the job as a brand manager, which to Abby's point about not knowing, I did not take marketing. I was um, a fruit science major and wanted to get into viticulture. So I thought, yeah, sure, I could figure this out. Um, and I sort of did, and in the scope of that, though, too, I ran the tasting room for a while when they needed somebody to do that. I was out in the field taking um, Samples, helping harvest, like the whole gamut, helping bottle wine. It was a pretty cool experience, um, but I wasn't making very much money. So I also then made a move to Earthbound Farms and just took a job as an admin person. I figured it was a foot in the door. I could start to meet people that way and learn about Earthbound Farms. Um, I really, I veered all over the place. And during that time, I found out about, well, I kind of knew about, um, pest control advisors, and so I got my PCA license, um, which interesting if we go way back to college and just a word of advice, don't let anyone discourage you. I had an instructor tell me that the test was way too hard, um, which was baloney because it wasn't that hard. Um, so I got my PCA license, went to work actually at the Ag Commissioner's Office in Pesticide Use Enforcement, which was a great way just to learn the valley, meet growers, and from there I became a PCA with Tanamir and Antle, which um, Josh and I used to work together a long time ago. Um, and really there I said yes to all kinds of things. When I had downtime in the winter, I asked what else can I do, and I filed, which is a pretty random thing to do for a pest control advisor, but it was a great way to like meet some upper level management people and kind of know what they were up to. 
Um, I also got involved in food safety audits and became the ranch liaison or the farm liaison and would go to Yuma and do audits. So kind of that gave me this really well-rounded perspective of what was going on um, on, a, on a farm level and with a, and with a shipping company. Um, and that led me then to take a new job in when 2006 when we had the E. coli outbreak in spinach and food safety really became a critical need on the farms. I then went to work for a grower and developed his food safety program, helped manage the harvesting crews, which then in turn led to my next position as a vice president of food safety and regulatory compliance, uh, managing 500 people in a harvesting department, overseeing HR, which was another thing that I was like, nah, sure, I'll figure that out. Um, because really, ultimately, I, ca I care about people, and I figured if you're going to go into HR, that's the most critical thing, is to be interested in your workforce and care about them, and I wanted to make sure everyone was treated fairly. So to me, that was a great opportunity to get my hands in there and see what was going on. Um, and uh, at the same time, I managed the food safety program. So um, hopping around like that, meeting lots of people, getting involved in organizations like CWA, um, just led to a lot of different relationships. And when the past executive director of Leafy Greens Research Program was ready to retire, she gave me a call and just said, hey, Jen, would you be interested? And um, so this was an awesome opportunity for me and a way to get back into like really being a geek and reading a lot about research stuff that's going on and kind of helping to direct research in the industry, which I'm pretty excited about. So that's hopefully that wasn't too long of a story. Yeah, yeah, was, I love Jen's story, but I love all the stories. Go for it, Jackie. So I went to, um, born and raised in Watsonville area. I went to school um, in Chicago, University of Chicago. Um, I came back home and I did not want to work for my parents or be around them as per usual. Um, so I took a job at Univision in marketing. Um, that's sort of what my major was, uh, business and marketing. Um, wasn't liking it. It was basically door-to-door -door sales and trying to get people to buy commercials and radio. That's, it was fun and I could do it, but I was certainly not. Um, there was a job opening that I was kind of headhunted for as an admin, so basically assistant to the operations person at um, a berry company. Um, I interviewed. I did know anything of what they were saying that the job required and I said I knew everything that I <laughs> that the job required um, got the job um, and six months into it I was very very bored um, serving coffee and, and which was great it was a job and it was close to my home but I started saying yes I basically there was would you like to be part of this meeting and, and take notes something so simple as taking notes and I said yeah sure I'll do it um, then it was helping the person that was doing the organic audits um, because it was too many ranches and so it was just putting maps together and then when that person said hey I'm going to move on to something else do you want to continue with the CCOF audits and I was still the admin but I was just taking on a bunch of added responsibilities because I wanted to because I knew that I really didn't want to be the admin for forever um, so it was that and then it was other regulatory compliance um, things that came up and I would say yes to them or reviewing leases or having conversations with landowners uh, because hey can you call this landowner and see where the check is for the rent and we would that conversation would lead to something else and then um, so basically saying yes to a bunch of different things um, 10 years later um, I left there as director of their partnership operations um, great company I left for growth opportunity it wasn't really anything just that this opportunity with Andrew Williamson came up and um, great company um, innovative. Um, so now I am director of operations for Andrew Williamson. Um, but yes, pretty much it has been right place, right time, a little bit of luck, um, a little bit of fudging on yes, can you do that? Um, and just agreeing and, and learning on the process and, and being open to and not ever having a, that's not my job conversation. Really, really take that word out of whatever sentence you have with any, either school or job, that's not my job, is not what a manager wants to hear. That's it. Yeah, all right, so for me, um, I'm, I'm gonna start back a little ways when I was in high school, and just because uh, of the audience, I, I think it's important that I share this little bit of a story, and I'll try not to make it too long, but um, 
Ag started and stopped at the grocery store for my family. We weren't involved in ag. We knew nothing about ag. I knew nothing about ag other than I lived in Salinas and there was ag all around. And so one day in high school, I decided that I better at least educate myself. And, and I'm gonna come back to this theme again multiple times in this little story, but it's something you've heard from the panelists that just left and the speaker this morning. I got out there, I met a farmer. I just drove onto a farm, to be honest with you. Told the guy, I don't want any money, I just need your time. Teach me what this is all about because I live here, I should just be educated, right? And he did, he put me in his truck and he said, okay, come with me. And I spent a week with him. And it, in that week, I was hooked. To me, it was an honest way to make a living and it was something that I, I became very passionate about very quickly. And, and I think that's the key is just, have a passion for whatever it is you're going after, educate yourself on that industry. So that one week ride around, that farmer told somebody at a grower shipper, which happened to be River Ranch, which no longer exists, they offered me a summer internship. I took that summer internship, and I took the same internship for the next three years, went off to Cal Poly, got a degree in agriculture because I was loving what I was doing on my internship and all the, the people that were offering me opportunities. And all along the way, just like they said, I was willing to do anything and everything they told me to do just because I was eager to learn. I was passionate about ag. I wanted to do it. So they said, go walk a broccoli field. Okay, I'm going to go be the best broccoli walker you can find because I wanted to learn and I wanted to be educated. And all of that led me out of Cal Poly with an MBA in agriculture and back into the business. And I walked right into a job. The day I graduated was Saturday and I started work on Monday and I had a job waiting for me only because, again, I was willing to say yes along the way, and I genuinely, at my core, had a passion for agriculture and wanted to be a part of this industry. So I knew early on that I wanted to be in the industry, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and today I'm doing exactly what I wanted, or I thought I wanted to do way back in high school. So I'm one of the lucky ones that got to do that, and along the way, it's just been a lot of people helping me, to be honest with you. Um, I'm not the smartest, I'm not the fastest. I'm, I just happen to be somebody who's passionate about ag and a lot of people have helped me along the way to get to where I am, for sure. Awesome. So I'm gonna start with Jackie on this one, bounce around just a little bit. What motivates you? And we just heard a lot from Josh about what motivates him. Um, what does your best day look like? Best day, okay. Um, for me, I'm, I'm very people driven. Um, Ag, it takes hundreds and thousands of people to get a box of strawberries into the market. But, but what goes into it? It's not just the, the berry and it looking the best.